Part Four, Chapter Thirty Two, Eve, March nineteen sixteen, Brussels. The trial was over in a single day. For Eve, those grinding hours in the imposing room passed in a blur. Violette stared straight ahead when they were all marched in under guard, and Lily cast her mobile gaze all around the high glass ceiling and Kirill chairs. And proud Belgian lions, but Eve focused downward on her mottled skin, half-heeled fingers clenched together in front of her. They still hurt savagely, despite the passage of the intervening months. The pain seemed far more important than the drone of German words overhead. More formalities as the other officials filed in. Eve's eyes traveled from face to face: German soldiers, German officials, German clerks, but no Frenchmen. No civilians allowed in to view the spectacle. Rene Bordelon was not here to crane his gaze at the ruin he had made of her, and for that Eve was grateful. She dreaded seeing his face more than she dreaded hearing her sentence. Had she seen him, she knew she would have collapsed, shivering to the thick carpet. I did not used to be so small and fearful, she thought as one of the judges harangued them. She had been this broken thing for months now. Lying in her cell, trembling and weeping at any provocation, and she still wasn't used to it. The only thing fierce about Eve anymore was her self-loathing. Betrayer. The whisper was a part of her blood now. It pulsed with every heartbeat, poisonous and matter-of-fact. Betrayer. Lily knew of her betrayal. They'd barely been allowed to speak to each other these past months in their separate prison cells in Saint Gilles. But Eve had bribed one of the guards to tell Lily what she'd done. She couldn't have carried the weight of that betrayal as a lie. Eve's heart hammered now as she gazed across the room, forcing herself to look past Violette's stolid profile to where Lily sat. Spit on me, Eve begged silently. I have earned it. But all Lily did was smile. A small face flashed one of its mischievous looks, as though she didn't sit ringed about by hostile guards. As if she was still a free woman, and she put two fingers to her lips and blew Eve a kiss. Eve flinched as though the kiss were a blow. They were questioned one at a time, not allowed to hear each other's testimony. Violette first, her real name of Leonie von Hauter, spoken for the first time in Eve's hearing, though she still couldn't think of Lily's lieutenant by any name but Violette. She at least viewed Eve as the traitor she was. The other woman's stare was hate-filled as Eve filed out under guard. Eve was brought in to be questioned next, and she didn't bother with a defense. Everyone here knows what the outcome will be. She stood silent under the harangue of German, feeling her hands throb, breathing the stale smells of hair oil and shoe polish. And soon enough, she was led out again. Lily was the one they most wanted. She could sense the liquid ripple that went over the room in anticipation. Almost savage, and wondered if such a ripple had gone over the viewers in the Colosseum before the lions were released. The lions in this room were gold and carved, but they could still levy death. The judges disappeared. Half an hour ticked past, measured by a deliberate clock, and it was over. Eve, Lily, Violette, and several lesser defendants were all arrayed before the court, and a vast silence fell. Eve's mouth went dry as paper, and she could feel herself trembling. At the corner of her eye, she saw Violette's fingers twitch as though she wanted to reach for Lily's hand. Lily stood like a statue. The words rolled out in nasal German. For Louise de Bettigny, death. For Leonie van Hout, death. For Evelyn Gardner, death. Ripples crossed the room. And Eve felt as though she'd been kicked in the chest, not by dread, relief. She looked down at her mangled hands with blurring eyes and thought, as she'd thought while weeping on the floor of Renee's green-walled study, "I want to die. No more months of cells and monotony, pain and morphine and guilt. Just the mouths of the guns arrayed before her. The imagined sight was beautiful. A ripple of gunfire, and then nothing." But before her heart could squeeze in relief, Lily stepped forward. She spoke in soft, perfect German—the only time in the entire trial she spoke in the language of the enemy. Gentlemen, 
I ask you not to shoot my friends. They are young, and I implore your mercy for them. Her blonde head tilted. Me. I want to die well. I accept my sentence. Violet spoke in clear, contemptuous tones, cutting her leader off. You can shoot me, but I ask you before I die, and you cannot refuse me. Do not part me from Lily, from Louise de Bettigny. Eve heard her own voice. Or me. A row of German faces looked down at them, and Eve saw blank confusion there. She'd seen the same expression from their guards at Saint-Gilles. Bewilderment, looking at tiny Lily and stuttering Eve, and Violette with her glasses like a schoolteacher, wondering how any of them could possibly be spies. The bush have held us for months, Eve thought, and they still don't know what to make of the Fleur du Mal. The thought gave her a flicker of savage pride for a moment, something to straighten her shoulders before the guilt flattened them again. The three women of the Alice Network were allowed to stand as further discussion carried on in whispers among the German officials. Another hour crept past. Eve's hands throbbed. Another announcement. Another kick resounding dully through her chest. Only this was not relief. This was despair. The trial was done. So, Lily said, they will not shoot us. Violet was still shivering in reaction as they waited in the courtyard between their guards. Eve stood numb and upright, but the news seemed to have nearly shattered Violette, who had looked braced for a bullet right then and there in the courtroom. They will send us to Germany, she muttered. The sentence had been amended. They were all to suffer fifteen years' hard labor in Siegburg prison. Fifteen years? Lily wrinkled her nose. No. We labor until the victory of France. That is all. I w w wish it was the line of guns, Eve heard herself saying. Violet's red-rimmed eyes bored into her, bitter and accusing. You deserve the guns, she said, and spat full into Eve's face. Judas. The guards intervened, dragging Violette a few paces away. Eve stood unmoving letting the warm spittle trickle down her cheek, and the other guards let Lily approach, drawing back a little. Only a tiny oasis of privacy, but it was the most a prisoner could expect. Sorry, little Daisy. The touch of a worn cuff against Eve's cheek, wiping her clean. She almost flinched at the sensation. She hadn't been touched kindly in so long. Violette takes it hard. She hates me. Eve said without rancor. For b betraying you? Pah. Who knows how the Bosch got my name or found out I ran the network? You don't remember giving it up? Opium or no opium? Lily shrugged in complete indifference. I was identified. How that happened doesn't matter. It does, Eve stated. A smile. Not to me. Eve nearly wept. Do not forgive me. She wanted to cry. Please do not forgive me. Forgiveness hurt so much more than hatred. Violette was allowed to rejoin them, glaring but quiescent, and Eve welcomed her silent loathing. They all stood in silence, waiting for the cars that would take them back to their cells. From there, it would probably be a matter of days until they were transported to Ziegbrock Prison. Ziegbrock. Eve had heard horror stories of that place. She looked east toward Germany and saw the other women looking too, as though the prison's dank walls were already in sight. Do not think about it, mes anges. Lily came up between Eve and Violette, putting an arm around each and squeezing hard. Enjoy the present. You are both here, and I am close to you. Eve leaned her head on Lily's shoulder, and they all stood in the pale March sunlight, waiting to be taken away. Chapter 33 Charlie June 1947 Through the remainder of the night, I stared at the photograph of a monster and tried to make sense of what he'd done. You got Rose killed, I thought, over and over. You got Rose killed. An SS officer had given the order to fire, and a German soldier had pulled the trigger. 
But my cousin would never have been targeted at all if not for this man in his elegant suit and silver-headed cane. I hadn't been able to answer Eve's question. I was too shocked, taking the photograph and stumbling back to my room in complete silence. I felt as though I'd been hit by a boulder, lying across my bed, limp and crushed under the weight. René Bordelon, the name echoed. You got Rose killed. He had always been the link between Eve and me. Rose had worked for him. Eve had worked for him. Two women out of probably thousands who had labored in his employ over the decades. And because of that unremarkable fact, his name on a piece of paper had led me to Eve, and then here. But I had never sought the link more than a paper one. By dawn, I was dressed, packed, and headed out to the front steps of the auberge. It didn't surprise me to see Eve already there with her satchel at her feet, straight and fierce and smoking her first cigarette of the day. She turned, and I saw that her eyes were as red and grained as mine. I'll do it, I said. I'll help you track him down. Good, Eve said, as matter-of-factly as if I'd agreed to help her get a cup of coffee. Finn's getting the car. We stood and waited in the pink morning light. Why do you even want my help? I couldn't help asking. Another question I'd turned over last night. You've wanted to bring this man to justice for more than 30 years. Wouldn't it be easier without some pregnant college girl in tow? You don't need me. Though a large part of me wished she did. I wanted to take care of her, even if she was prickly as a handful of needles. No, I don't need you, she said briskly. But the bastards wronged both of us, not just me. And that means you have a right to revenge if you want it. I believe in revenge. Eve looked at me, inscrutable. I've lost faith in much over the years, but not that. She stood there tall and stony as an obelisk, and I wondered just what form her revenge was going to take. It gave me a disquieting pang as the Laganda came around the corner. Besides, Eve said in an undertone as Finn loaded the bags into the trunk. I may not need you, but I definitely need him. And I put the odds at 50-50 that wherever you go, he goes. I blinked. What makes you say that? She touched a red mark on my throat that I'd seen in the mirror this morning and tried to cover with my loosened hair. A mark Finn's mouth had left last night. Mine is the difference between a mosquito bite and a love bite, Yank. Done with your blithering, ladies. Finn came around the driver's side. That's a bro morning for a drive. Yes, I mumbled, ears burning. Eve grinned as she climbed into the back seat. Finn missed the grin, but he saw my red flush and paused after he slid behind the wheel. All right, lass, he asked quietly. There wasn't really a word for what I was after the past day and night together. Grieving and hopeful, profoundly shocked and profoundly angry. Angrier every time I looked at the photograph of the old man we had all agreed to track down. And if I looked at Finn, my skin tingled with an all-over flash of what had passed between us, not twelve hours ago. I'm all right, I said finally. He nodded, and I couldn't tell how things stood between us, if he was sorry or not for what had happened. So I left him to put the car in gear, and turned to Eve in the back seat. One thing you haven't told us... How do we find René Baudelon? He's not going by that name anymore. Or René de Malassie, either. And we don't know where he went when he fled Limoges. So how do we pick up his trail from here? Eve took a last drag of her cigarette and flicked the end into the street. I have an idea about, th th about that. He told me more than once that he intended to retire in Grasse. That he even had some dilapidated property there. An old villa he might restore some day. He's 73 now. He won't be starting another restaurant. Sounds like retired to me. I'll wager he went to rebuild that villa, read his books, play his music, and enjoy the southern sunshine. I say we go to g g class And do what? I raised my eyebrows. Drive around looking out the window? Give me some credit, Yank. René never told me where his property in Grasse was, but I've got some good ideas of how to find it. But what if he isn't there at all? Finn sounded doubtful. All we have is a few chance remarks made more than thirty years ago. Has anyone he he here got a better idea of where to start? 
Admittedly, I didn't. I shrugged. Finn reached for the set of maps crumpled at my feet. At an easy pace, we make grass in two days. Stop in Grenoble tonight. Grenoble it is. Eve tilted her head back, closing her eyes to the sky. Step on it, Scotsman. The Laganda hummed along southeast, the three of us each lost in our own thoughts. I found myself looking at the photograph of René again. I wondered what that SS officer had looked like, the one who gave the orders to massacre the village. I wondered what the German soldiers had looked like, the ones who could look at a girl fleeing a burning church with a baby in her arms and be willing to pull the trigger. Anger flushed through me, slow and burning, and I thought of what Eve had said about those men, that I'd likely never find out which soldiers killed Rose. Maybe I could, someday. Names had to exist, records. Maybe the German soldiers who survived could be brought to trial, not just for Rose, but for Madame Rufanche and her murdered village. Orador Soglan deserved justice for its dead as much as any of the atrocities investigated at Nuremberg. But that was a problem for another day. Pierre, now, aimed for Grasse. The Nazis who had a hand in Rose's death were out of my reach. But René Baudelon might not be. As the car rolled through ever-rising hills and the gorgeous expanse of lakes and pastures, I pondered a new equation. Rose plus Lily, divided by Eve plus me, equaling René Baudelon. Four women with one man among us all. I stared at his face in the grainy photograph, looking for remorse, guilt, cruelty. But you couldn't see those things in a picture. He was just an old man out to dinner. I tried to tuck the photograph back into Eve's satchel, but her gnarled hand lashed out like a whip and knocked mine away. Keep it. The photograph went into my pocketbook, and I could feel that man's empty eyes staring at me through the leather. So I turned around and looked back at Eve. She looked steadier lighter than the hunched, guilt-consumed figure in the windowsill last night, reciting her tale of torture and self-loathing. I reached out and touched her hand gently. You wouldn't tell us about your trial last night, I said. Or what happened to you and Lily and Violette afterward. Not a tale for dark nights. I tilted my head up at the hot sun above. No shadows now. She let out a long breath. I suppose not. Finn and I listened as she told us of the trial, the Belgian lions, the hammering questions in German, the reduced sentences, Violette spitting in her face. I remembered the older Violette in Roubaix doing the same, and shivered at the echo. Violette. An idea pricked me there, an insistent little thought I'd had last night as well, an equation that didn't balance out. But I pushed that aside for now, as Eve said. Then we came to Siegburg. Chapter 34 Eve March 1916 After the war ended, Eve was surprised by how little impression Siegburg's endless flow of days had made in her memory. Her time as a spy in Lille had stretched not even six months, yet she remembered it all in diamond-edged clarity. Two and a half years in Siegburg passed like a foul gray dream, every day the same as the one before. Take her to her cell. That was her welcome to Siegburg, in the spring of sixteen. A brusque order, and then a heavy hand in the middle of her back, shoving her down a dark corridor after Lily and Violette. None of them had had a look at the prison's outside. It was far too dark by the time the rattling van pulled into the courtyard. Never mind, Lily whispered. We shall have a good look at it over our shoulders, the day we're released. But it was hard to think of release when being shoved along a corridor that smelled of piss and sweat and despair. Eve found herself shivering, pressing her teeth together so they would not rattle. The creak of a key being turned, hinges squealing, and then a massive door yawned. Gardner, the guard barked, and that same brusque hand shoved Eve forward. Wait! She turned, frantic for a glimpse of Lily and Violette, but the door had already slammed. The blackness was absolute, a pool of stifling, freezing darkness. Everyone breaks down the first night. Eve would hear that later from her fellow prisoners. But Eve came to Siegburg, already broken. The blackness was not nearly as terrible as the inside of her own mind. So she merely unlocked her chattering teeth 
and felt her way around the cell with misshapen fingers. Stone walls, smaller in dimension than her cell in Saint-Gilles. A foul bed, hard as wood and stinking of old sweat, old vomit, old terror. Eve wondered how many women had slept and cried and stifled their screams in that bed. Dimly through the door she heard cries, once a burst of shrill laughter, but no guard answered the calls. Once the cells were locked for the night at Siegburg, Eve learned soon enough. They weren't open until morning. A woman might be dying slowly of fever or blood poisoning, shrieking with pain over a broken bone, writhing in the agony of giving birth. The door still wouldn't open until dawn. A good many died that way. That was, Eve supposed dully, the entire point. She couldn't lie down on that foul bed. She curled in the corner on the stones, shaking with cold, waiting for morning. Dawn arrived in the company of a hard-faced guard, marching in with a stack of clothes. Rough blue stockings, dirty white frock with a great prisoner's cross on the chest. And the endless string of captive days began. Hunger, cold, lice, slaps from the guards. The daily labor, rough sewing with pricked fingers, polishing latches with a brace of cleaners, pushing together little caps of metal, whispered conversations with the other women. Was it true that there had been a battle at Montsoray, the Somme? Was it true the British had captured La Boiselle, contre la maison? Even more than food, the prisoners craved news. All they heard from the guards was that the Germans were winning. Liars, Lily snorted. Such liars. They're losing and they know it. All we need to do is endure. Endure, Eve thought. A year slipped by. More foul grey days, more slaps, more lice, more screams in the night. Lily's serene confidence, burning brighter even as her body whittled down to stark bone. Black, dreamless nights on that foul-smelling cot. Seeing women sweat to death from yellowing fevers, waste away under the twin grinding stones of cold and hunger. Seeing them stagger to the infirmary, that huge room with its ugly green shades that stank of shit and blood. Some called it the lazaretto. Some just called it hell. You didn't go to the infirmary to be treated. You went there to die. The Germans didn't need to waste bullets killing their female prisoners when neglect and disease could do it for them. A sound strategy, Eve thought remotely. Women dying in hospital beds resulted in far less international outcry than women dying before firing squads. And what women these were. Identical skeletons wearing the same prisoner's cross, dirty-haired, hollow-eyed fleur du mal, every one. Fiery Louise Thelise, who had smuggled soldiers across borders for Edith Cavill. Belgian-born Madame Ramé, whose son had been shot and whose two daughters had accompanied her to prison. The stoic Princesse de Croix, who had organized a spy network in Belgium. Before Siegburg, Eve had never known just how many women there were who had risked all for the war. Even now, in their way, they continued to fight. Madame Blanquert says those little steel caps we have been given to assemble are grenade heads, Lily whispered. Shall we do something about it? Lily, Violette said wearily. Don't provoke them. Ta girl. It's inconceivable that we be put to work on ammunition to be used against our countrymen. And the following day, the words were shouted out. In the name of England, of France, of Belgium, and of all allied countries, I implore my companions to adamantly refuse to work on munitions. Germany does not have the right to demand from us this work of death against our homelands, to force us to ourselves make the engines which, in battle, will strike our fathers, our brothers, our husbands, our sons. We all here continue to fight and suffer courageously for king, for our flags, for our homelands. And all over Zeigborg, the grey-faced female skeletons were suddenly alight, screaming like Valkyries, even as the guards ran back and forth, shoving, slapping, shouting. Eve screamed until her throat stung, even when she got a clenched fist across the cheekbone that snapped her head back like a whip. The world for a moment was bright, screaming colour, rather than soul-leaching grey. Eve screamed until she was bundled back into her cell, and Lily laughed even as the guards hauled her and Madame Blanquette away to solitary confinement for inciting the strike. Well worth it, 
she said when they finally let her out a month later. Eve wasn't sure. Lily was just a handful of bones, insubstantial as a shadow. Eve dropped her own blanket around the other woman's shoulders. Endure. All we need do is endure. Another endless grey year. A freezing spring coming late in 1918. And with it a cautious hope feathering its way through the prisoners. The bush are losing. The whisper went around as the year advanced. They're beaten, falling back everywhere along the front. It wasn't just the whispered rumours that made their way inside prison walls. Rumours of English victories and French encroachments on German territory. Everyone could see the slump in the shoulders of the guards, hear the increasing shrillness and the assertions of German victory. It hovered in the air. The bloody slog of war might finally be coming to an end. If it had ended sooner, Eve later thought on the long nights when she was staring down the barrel of a Luger. If it had ended just a few short months sooner. September, 1918. Thank you for coming, little Daisy. Lily lay in the cold infirmary, her body hardly making an impression below the grubby blankets. Eve perched on the cot's edge, shivering in her prison smock. She should have been with the other women working, but there had been a typhus epidemic not long ago, and when Eve reported feeling feverish and headachey, they were quick to send her to the infirmary. Easy then to sneak from her own cot to Lily's. How are you feeling? She managed to ask. Not so terrible. Lily patted her side. For a while now, she'd suffered from a pleural abscess between two of her ribs, but had made light of it. The surgeon will lance the thing, and it will be done. The surgery was scheduled for four in the afternoon. Not long now. They're bringing a surgeon from Bonn. Eve tried to quell her apprehension. Lancing an abscess was surely minor surgery. But in this understaffed hellhole, on a half-starved woman... Lily is not afraid, Eve reminded herself. Don't you be either. But perhaps Lily was afraid, because she fixed Eve with an unusually sober gaze. Her lively eyes were sunk into a face that was little more than a skull. Take care of Violette for me, if... An expressive shrug. You're going to be fine. Eve cut her off before she could go further. You have to be. It was what she'd clung to for more than two years. Evelyn Gardner had betrayed her friends, had broken down and brought them to this foul place. If she could bring them out again safely, some part of that betrayal could be forgotten, if not ever forgiven. It was what she thought every day when she pushed half her bread ration to Lily's hands, when she tried to give her blankets to Violette, even though Violette still looked at her with stony eyes. Bring them out safely, and you will have atoned. And she'd almost done it. Surely the war could not go on much longer. We are almost there. Almost home. Perhaps Lily saw some of that desperation in Eve's eyes, because she reached out and laid her emaciated fingers over Eve's misshapen ones. Take care of yourself, little Daisy. If I'm not here to haul you out of trouble, don't say that. Eve gripped Lily's hand, panic choking her. She was not going to lose Lily, not over an abscess. Not now. Not after more than two years of imprisonment. Not so close to the end. It's just a lance and drain operation. Of course you'll survive. Lily's voice was steady. But the Germans have no interest in my survival, ma petite. Eve's eyes welled because she couldn't deny it. The officials of Zeigborg hated every bone in Lily's troublemaking body and made no secret of it. You shouldn't have led that strike, or... Or what? Caused strife from the day she walked through Zeichberg's doors. Planned elaborate escapes. Kept spirits high with jokes and stories. If Lily had been the sort to keep her head low, she would not have led the most efficient spy network in France. You are going to be fine, Eve repeated stubbornly. And would have said more, but two orderlies appeared. Up, Bertignier. The surgeon has arrived. Lily could barely stand. Eve slid an arm around her shoulder, lifting her to her feet. She wore a shapeless, dish-rag-coloured smock, and she made a face at it. Quelle horreur! What I'd give for something in pink moiré! 
and a morally questionable hat, Eve managed to say. I'd settle for some morally questionable soap. My hair is filthy. Eve's throat caught. Lily, pray for me when I go in there. Gesturing with her sharp little chin in the direction of the surgery. I need people praying for me. I wrote a letter to my old mother Prioress in Anderlecht. But I'll take your prayers any day, Evelyn Gardner. It was the first time Lily used Eve's real name. Even after the trial, they went on using the old code names, the ones that felt true. I cannot pray for you, Eve whispered. I do not believe in God anymore. But I do. Lily kissed the rosary knotted through her fingers, even as the orderlies took her by the elbows. So Eve jerked out a nod. Then I'll pray, she said. And I'll see you in a few hours. I will. They hauled Lily out of the infirmary. Eve following behind. A nurse came out of the surgery at the end of the corridor, and for a moment Eve had a glimpse of the surgeon from Bonn smoking a cigarette. There was no bustle, Eve saw. No one sterilizing instruments. No one was making preparations with ether or chloroform. Lily, she thought in a wash of dread. Lily, don't go in there. Ahead she heard Lily's clear voice reciting her rosary. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our deaths. The corridor outside was thronged with women, Louise de Lys, the Princesse de Croy, Violette, as many of the Fla du Mal who could steal away from their work shifts, all anxious glances and murmured prayers for the Queen of Spies. The two orderlies picked up their feet, hastening Lily along, and her voice faltered in its calm recitation. For a moment Eve thought Lily would finally break, that she would collapse and weep, have to be carried off prostrate to her operating table. No, she straightened between the orderlies, lifting her chin in the old impish gesture, eyes darting along the line of her friends. The dull light struck her hair, coiled around her head in matted blonde braids, and it had the look of a crown. Mes amis, she said softly, and as she passed Violette, she reached out and pressed her rosary into those trembling hands. Je vous aime. And she was gone past them, tiny as a child between the two orderlies, almost floating as she went light-footed, light-hearted, down the long corridor toward the operating room. Eve felt her own heart beating sickly, somber as a drum. Lily. Just before she disappeared, Lily turned her head back one final time and gave her swift, mischievous glance. She blew a kiss to the Fla du Mal, and it hit Eve like a physical blow. Then Lily disappeared into the operating room, but her voice still floated out, merry and serene. You must be the surgeon. I wonder if I can have some chloroform, because it's been an absolute pisser of a day. That was when Eve's knees buckled. That was when she knew. She'll be fine, Louise Thelise was saying. It would take more than a long abscess to bring down our Lily. Nothing at all. More murmurs of agreement. Assurances spoken over eyes full of worry. Violette clutched the rosary so hard its looped beads cut into her fingers. She'll be out of bed within a week. Less than a week. But Violette wasn't there in the infirmary for the next four hours, as Eve was. The guards shooed the prisoners away, but Eve was still under observation for typhus symptoms. She was just a corridor and a locked door away when the moans came, and the whimpers, and the strangled screams the sounds of a woman being operated upon without ether, without chloroform, without morphine. Eve sat huddled on her cot, as all her stubborn hope drained away, sobbing so hard she almost drowned out the noise of Lily's agony. But not quite. Eve heard it all, start to finish. By morning she had sobbed herself mute. Her voice was gone. And so was Lily. Excerpt from La Guerre des Femmes, Memoir of Louise de Bettinier's War Work, by Antoine Redier, as told to him by his wife, Leonie Van Houten, codename Violette Lameron. She finished as she had lived. A Soldier. Chapter 35 Charlie June 1947 My head hurt. 
I'd so hoped that the Queen of Spies was still alive, that we might meet her on this journey as we'd met Violette. A white-haired woman now, but still small and gallant and merry. Someone I'd ached to know, but she'd never had the chance to grow old. Eve, I wanted to say to the figure hunched in the back seat, I'm so sorry. But words were just air, useless after a tale like that. Finn had pulled the Laganda over to the side of the road twenty minutes before as we listened. And now we sat in the summer sun, utterly still. I reached out for Eve's knobbed hands as she lowered them from her face. But she was speaking again, looking pale and ravaged in the merciless sunlight. There it is. You know it all. Lily died the ugliest death a brave woman ever suffered. And it was all thanks to me. I sent her inside those walls and I failed to bring her out again. Denial boiled in me furiously. No, no, you were not to blame. You cannot think that. But she did think that, and all the words in the world from me would not shift her self-loathing. I knew that much about Evelyn Gardner. As much as I was always yearning to fix what was broken, I could do nothing to fix Eve. Or could I? She passed a gnarled hand across her mouth, both were trembling. Get this car moving, Scotsman, she said hoarsely. We aren't getting to Grenoble by sitting on a roadside. Finn steered the Laganda back onto the road, and we finished the long drive in silence, worn out from the stark, ugly end of Eve's confession. Eve sat him back with her eyes closed. Finn drove like a chauffeur, looking front and center, only speaking up to ask for a map. As for me... I sat turning over an idea. A lovely city, Grenoble. Compact houses and pretty little churches. The lazy blue meandering of the rivers Drac and Isère. Framed all around by the distant cloud-wrapped Alps. Another auberge. And Finn helped Eve up the stairs with the baggage, casting a glance back at me. I have to make a telephone call, I said. And he probably thought I meant to my family. But the call I put through at the hotel desk after a long wrangle with the French operator, wasn't to the United States. It was to a china shop in Roubaix, whose name I fortunately remembered. Allô? I'd only met her once, but I knew her voice immediately. I imagined her turning her head, spectacles reflecting the light. Violette Lameron, I greeted her. A long pause. Who are you? Charlotte Sinclair, madame. You saw me not long ago. I came into the shop with Eve Gardner. Marguerite Lefrancois, as you knew her. Please don't hang up. Because she was on the verge. I could tell from the controlled rasp of breathing on the other end of the line. What do you want? Her voice came noticeably colder. I wouldn't help that Judas bitch out of a burning house. So if it's a favor for her. I fought down a swell of anger the urge to snap that nothing was Eve's fault, the urge to ask how well she would have held out against a glass of opium and ten broken fingers. But Violette was as invested in Eve's guilt as Eve was herself, and nothing I could say would shift either of them. Only facts would do that. And for the facts, I needed Violette. Someone needs to look into the trial records where you and Eve and Lily were sentenced. I lowered my voice, turning my back on the curious hotel clerk. I believe there's a lie hiding in there. I'd thought it from the first, hearing about the exchange of information that condemned Lily. Something there did not add up correctly. Solve for X. Violette sounded rather contemptuous. You're just a little American. What could you possibly know about records for a European trial 30 years past? I could surmise a lot more than she thought all those summers working in my father's office, specializing in international law. I'd indexed and notated French and German legal books. I'd filed trial paperwork. I'd heard my father expound over dinner as he compared European and American law. The trial of three female spies in the heart of wartime would have been very well documented, I told Violette. You three were heroines, famous. German officers, French newspapers, Belgian clerks, English diplomats all paying attention that day. Everything about your trial would have been filed away, if only so it could be produced as proof of no wrongdoing later. If there's a lie in there, it can be found. 
It's just a matter of getting a look at the records. Will you help? What's lie? Violette asked, curiosity sharpening her voice despite herself. Got you, I thought, and told her. An even longer silence fell. Why ask me? You don't know me, mademoiselle. I know what you're capable of, because Eve's told me all about you. You won't stop until you get the truth. I don't know if the trial records are public or sealed after all this time. But if they're sealed, I imagine you could get access much more easily than me. Because you were on trial that day. And you can argue your right to know the full story. And you don't have the full story, you or Eve. Because you didn't hear all the deliberations. I laid out a little honey, thinking it couldn't hurt. You're a war heroine, Violette. Surely there are powerful people who still respect you, who owe you favors, who will pull strings for you. You'll find a way to get the information if it's there. And if it is, just tell me. Tell me if I'm right. Please. She was silent so long I feared the connection had dropped. I stood there dry-mouthed at the desk. Please, I begged silently. Violette sounded bemused when she spoke, but she sounded honed as well, as if the spy inside the respectable shopkeeper had opened her eyes for the first time in years. I didn't think that part ever died, not in women like Eve and Violette. Where would I contact you, Mademoiselle St. Clair, if I found anything? I promised to telephone her from Grasse tomorrow with the name of our hotel, and hung up feeling shaky. I cast a fishing line to the water. Now all I could do was wait and see if anything came up on the other end. I wondered, going upstairs, if I should tell Eve what I'd done, but answered myself with a resounding no. She looked so fragile in the car, frail enough to crumble at the slightest blow. I wasn't raising her hope about anything until I had something in hand to warrant it. Entering the silence of my pretty little room, I flung open the shutters and looked out into the fast-falling twilight. Couples promenaded below, arm in arm, and I remembered Rose and me laughing about someday being old enough to go on double dates. I saw a tall blonde hand in hand with a laughing boy, but my memory didn't subtly try to give her Rose's face. She was just a girl, no one I knew. My hallucinatory flashes of seeing Rose everywhere I looked seemed to have stopped since Oradour sur Glen. Come back, I thought, looking at the throng. Come back, Rosie. But of course she wasn't coming back. Like my brother, she was dead. A knock sounded. I thought it might be Eve, come to tell me what she had planned once we arrived in Grasse. But it was Finn. He looked different, and it took me a moment to put my finger on it. He'd shaved, put on a jacket, worn at the elbows, but a handsome dark blue. And his shoes had been shined to a gleam. Come to dinner with me, he said without preamble. I didn't think Eve would come down to eat tonight. She looked like she wanted a whiskey supper. Whatever got her to oblivion fastest. Knowing now how Lily had died and how it haunted her, I could understand that better. God was done for the night. Finn patted his pocket, jingling with Eve's nightly haul of bullets. It'll just be us. Come to dinner with me, Charlie. Something in his tone made me straighten. From the way he'd dressed up... I didn't think he meant one of our usual quick refueling stops at the nearest cafe. Is this... is this a date? I asked, keeping my hand from going to my must hair. Yes. His eyes were steady. That's what a man does when he likes a lass. Puts on a jacket, puts a shine on his shoes, asks her to dinner. I don't know any men who do that. Not after we already... I got a flash of what we'd done in the car last night, the windows fogged up and our breath coming ragged. Your trouble is, your experience is all with boys, not men. I raised my eyebrows. Is that the gray-bearded voice of wisdom, coming from a man not quite thirty? What I mean is, it's not a matter of age. There are boys aged fifty, and men aged fifteen. That's all in what they do, not how old they are. He paused. A boy messes up with a lass, and he slinks off without fixing anything. A man makes a mistake, he fixes it. He apologizes. You're sorry for what happened then? 
I remembered him last night, his hands spanning my naked back as he said not too distinctly, this wasn't how I wanted to do this. My heart squeezed. I wasn't sorry at all. I don't regret it one bit. His voice was even. I'm just sorry it wasn't slower. Done after dinner and a date, not a fist fight and a bruised lip. That's not how you start things with a lass you like, and I like you, Charlie. You're smarter than any woman I know, a wee little adding machine in a black dress, and I like that. You've got a sharp tongue, and I like that too. You try to save everyone you meet, from your cousin and your brother, to hopeless cock-ups like Gardner and me, and I like that most of all. So I'm here to apologize. I'm here to take you to dinner. I'm here in a jacket. Pause. I hate jackets. I fought the smile spreading over my face, but I failed. He gave a smile back that was all in the crinkles around his eyes, and it made me positively weak in the knees. I cleared my throat, tugging at my striped jersey, and said, Give me ten minutes to change. Done. He pulled the door closed. An instant later, his voice floated through. Can you wear that black dress again? I didn't say it would be much of a dinner, he said. We leaned on the stone balustrade of an old bridge over the river Isère, a packet of sandwiches between us. Finn had bought them from a cafe near the Place Saint-André, and we were eating them right out of paper wrappings. I'm a bit skint. We wouldn't get a better view in a fancy restaurant. A dark night full of stars, the flow of water scattered with broken moonlight, and the murmur and rush of the city around us. Your favorite food, Finn said suddenly. What is it? I laughed. Why? That's something I don't know about you. There's a lot I don't know about you, Miss Sinclair. He reached out and touched a crumb on my lip, dabbing it away. That's what a first date is for. So, favorite food. He used to be a hamburger. Onion, lettuce, dab of mustard, no cheese. But since the rosebud here, patting my stomach. It's bacon, crispy, burned just a little. The way I'm eating, there won't be a pig left in France by the time this baby's born. What's your favorite food, Mr. Kilgore? Fish and chips from a proper chippy, lots of malt vinegar. Favorite color? I eyed his jacket, which made his hair look darker and his shoulders broader. Blue. Same here. Lost book you read. We traded back and forth, both of us a little silly and enjoying it. Finn asked me about college, and I told him about Bennington and algebra classes. I asked him how he'd gotten so good with cars, and he told me about working in his uncle's garage at age 11. The little things, the getting to know you things. Normally those conversations happened early on, before anyone got half naked in the back seat of a convertible but we'd done it all backward. The first thing you'd buy if you had 10,000 pounds sterling. My grandmother's pearls back. I love those pearls. You? A 46 Bentley Mark VI, Finn said promptly. First car made by Bentley and Rolls. That's a beauty. Though if it's 10,000 sterling I've got, maybe I could go all the way to the Ferrari 125S. I just debuted took six of thirteen races on the Piacenza circuit. He started telling me about the V12 engine, and it was utterly adorable. I couldn't have told you why it was adorable. When Trevor Preston Green bought me a milkshake after English Lit, and droned on for an hour about his Chevrolet Stylemaster coup, I wanted to upend my chocolate malt over his hair. But now I stood utterly charmed as Finn told me all about the Dodean type rear suspension. Listen to me blethering on, he broke off finally, seeing me smile. Yes, I said, bored to tears here. Tell me more about the five-speed gearbox. Makes a car go zoom, he said straight-faced. Your turn to blether about something boring. The Pythagorean equation, I said, picking something easy. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That means that for all right-angled triangles, the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. Finn mimed clutching his hair. Really now, simple Euclidean geometry is no reason for despair. We both laughed, 
tossing our sandwich crusts down for the geese honking noisily below. Afterward, we just leaned against the stones, gazing out at the water in comfortable silence. I wasn't used to silence on dates. Girls weren't supposed to let silence fall. You had to keep the conversation going so he wouldn't think you were a sad sack. Be interesting, be sparkling, or he won't ask you out again. But the silence now was as comfortable as the chatter. He was the one to break it, voice thoughtful. You think Gardner's right about Baudelon being in class somewhere? Retired and waiting to be found? Or is she half cracked? I hesitated, not wanting to disrupt this gentle peace with reality. It seems like an awful long shot, but she's been right more often than she's been wrong. A question of my own burst out. What happens if we do find him? What is Eve going to do? If she can prove he's René de Malassis from Limoges, who collaborated with the Nazis and formed for the Malice, and shot an employee in the back merely for petty theft, she can turn him in. Finn dusted the last sandwich crumbs off his hands. De Gaulle isn't kind to profiteering killers, even elderly ones. Baudelon would face prison, especially if it can be proved his collaboration resulted in the... in what happened at Orador Soglan. He'd lose his reputation, his freedom. Is that going to be enough for Eve? Finn looked at me. I looked at him. No, we said at the same time and his hand covered mine on the stone parapet of the bridge. We need to stop her from doing anything irrevocable, Finn. Real life wasn't a movie. In the real world, there were consequences for revenge. Consequences like prison. And Eve might have endured Psychborg as a girl. But I didn't think she'd survive now if she went to prison for assault, or whatever they called it in France. I'm not letting her burn up the rest of her life just to take that old bastard out. But it's her life was not it? Finn's fingers slid inside mine, so our hands slowly interlaced. I've been with Gardner a while now. I can understand her wanting to risk it all to make something right. Killing an old man is making things right. I can't be a party to that, even if he is a back-shooting murderer. I shivered, partly from the terrible thought, and partly because Finn's thumb was passing back and forth along the back of my hand, leaving tingles. We'll have to make sure she doesn't go off the rails. Wasn't that going to be a job? A job for tomorrow. Finn tugged me away from the balustrade. Promise me something, Charlie. What? Don't look at that photograph tomorrow. Just enjoy the drive. We meandered back to the hotel hand in hand, largely silent. Finn opened the door to guide me through, fingertips resting on my bare back, above the black dress's low V-slash and my skin rippled. He walked me down the corridor to my room, formally, as if I had a father who cared about my curfew glaring at the clock. I had a lovely time, he said, very solemn. I'll ring you tomorrow. Boys never call. Men call. We lingered inside our fragile bubble of happiness, the kind of happiness that sits on top of melancholy as easily as icing on a cake. I didn't want to leave it. I'm no good at this, Finn, I said at last. A yank in a black dress plus a Scotsman in a jacket, multiplied by a summer night and a packet of sandwiches, divided by an awkward silence and the fact that the yank had a pregnant belly. I didn't know how that equation came out, what it equaled. What happens now? He sounded hoarse. What happens now is entirely up to you. Oh, I stood a moment, looking at him, and then I went up on tiptoe. Our lips met, soft as drifting feathers, and I melted into him as his arms circled my waist. We kissed, slow and endless, Finn pressing me soft and yielding between the hard door and his hard chest, and I fumbled blindly behind me for the handle. The door burst open and we spilled through it, kissing and stumbling, my shoes landing on top of his discarded jacket. Finn got a hand loose from my hair and batted the door shut. He picked me up then, holding me in the air for another kiss. And then he made me shriek as he dropped me on the bed, from what seemed like a very long height. He stood for a moment looking down at me, and I couldn't believe I was this nervous. We'd already done this, but not in a bed, not with lights on. 
He dropped down with a groan, stretching himself long and luxuriant over me. Beds, he said, dropping slow kisses along my neck, the Scots burr coming thicker. Not a very big improvement on box seats. I fit just fine in both, I said as I tugged at his shirt. Because you're a midget. He submitted to my tugging, let me pull his shirt over his head, then flipped me back down, grinning. Quit rushing. It's not supposed to be a sprint. Thought you liked fast, I managed to say. In the light, he was lean and brown and beautiful. You and your five-speed gearboxes. Car should be fast. Bed should be slow. I tangled my hands in his hair, feeling my back arch as he dragged the zipper of my dress down inch by inch. How slow? Very, very slow, he murmured against my lips. Takes all night where we're going. All night? I hooked my legs around him, looking at the dark eyes so close to mine our lashes brushed. I am falling for you, I thought bemusedly. I am falling so hard. You've got to drive all the way to Grasse tomorrow, I whispered instead. What about sleep? Sleep? His hands twined through my hair so tight it hurt as he growled into my ear. Quit your blethering. Chapter 36 Eve March, 1919 It was Eve's first step back in England since her career as a spy began. Folkestone, where Cameron stood waving goodbye as Eve sailed to Le Havre, where he stood now, coat rippling about his knees, waiting for her on the pier. Miss Gardner, he said when she stepped off the ferry. It had been some months since her release. She'd lived that time in a bathtub, scrubbing obsessively as arrangements were made to bring her back from her temporary lodgings in Louvain to England. Captain Cameron, she answered. No, it's Major Cameron now, isn't it? Eyeing his new insignia. In addition to his majority was the blue and red ribbon of the DSO on the left breast of his uniform coat. I've missed a few, a few things being away. I was hoping to bring you back to England sooner. Eve shrugged. The women of Siegborg had been released before the armistice was even signed, let loose from their cells by defeated-looking prison officials, stampeding in a weeping and joyous flood for the trains that would take them home. Eve would have been weeping with joy too, had Lily been arm in arm with her to take that train. After Lily died, it had not mattered in the slightest how fast she could get away from Siegborg. Cameron's eyes were going over her now, registering the changes. Eve knew she was still thin as a rack, her hair straw-dry from lice treatments and hacked close to her skull. She kept her hands thrust into her pockets so he couldn't see the misshapen knuckles. But there was nothing she could do to hide her eyes, which never sat still anymore. Eve took in the world in constant darting glances now, looking for danger on all sides. Even here on the open pier, she angled her back against the nearest piling seeking protection. Eve registered the shock in Cameron's own steady eyes as he saw how deeply the past few years had marked her. They hadn't been kind to him either. Deep lines graven about his mouth, broken veins at his forehead, streaks of grey at his temples. I used to love you, Eve thought. But it was a blank thought, almost meaningless. She used to feel a lot of things before Lily died. Now what she mainly felt was grief and rage and guilt, devouring each other like tail-eating serpents, and the never-ending whisper of her blood saying, Betrayer. I thought there would be some Three Rings circus, Eve said at last, nodding at the empty pier. She had been almost the only person to disembark. Folkestone, now that the war was over, had reverted to a much sleepier place, and there were no aides or military attachés anywhere in sight. Major Allenton was in touch, kept going on about a welcome ceremony. Apparently, Evelyn Gardner was now a heroine. So were many of the other female prisoners. Violette, Eve heard, was fetid all over Roubaix when she returned home. Eve would be fetid too if she'd allow it, which she wouldn't. I talked Allenton out of the public welcome, Cameron said. He wanted a few generals to greet you, some newspaper men and so on. 
a brass band. Fortunate you discouraged him, though I'd have enjoyed hammering a bloody tuba over his ears. Eve hitched her satchel over her shoulder and set off down the pier. I thought I'd see you in France. Cameron fell in beside her. At Louise de Bettigny's funeral. I meant to go. Eve had got as far as Cologne, where Lily's original grave was to be opened, so her body could be repatriated back to her homeland, but never made it out of the hotel room. She'd ended up getting drunk instead, and nearly shooting the maid who came with her supper. The girl was squat, square-faced, and for a horrific moment Eve had thought she was the frog, that horrible woman in Lille who had strip-searched Eve and Lily. The memory dizzied Eve now, momentarily, and she gulped a deep breath of sea air. Cameron's voice was low. Why didn't you come? C -c -c couldn't face it. She'd said her goodbye to Lily in a corridor that stank of typhus and blood. She didn't need a graveside with droning plaudits and French generals. But she didn't say that to Cameron, just quickened her steps, suddenly needing to be away from him. Cameron's long legs kept up. Do you have anyone to meet you? A place to stay? I'll find something. His hand caught her elbow. Eve, stop. Let me help you, for God's sake. She wrenched free. He didn't mean any harm, but she couldn't bear to be touched. There were a lot of things she was finding she couldn't bear, now that she was out of prison. Open windows, crowds, wide spaces without corners to set her back against. Sleep. Keep it Miss Gardner, Cameron. Far better that way. She looked out at the ocean rather than meet his gaze. His soft eyes might swallow her whole, and Eve couldn't be soft. Not now. Tell me, she said instead. We d didn't get much news about the war inside prison, and now no one wants to go over old battles. Lily's last message, the one about the Vardin assault. Over and over, Eve had wondered how that assault went, what they changed by getting that message through. How did things go down? The French commander received your information. Cameron looked as if he wanted to stop there, but Eve's gaze pierced him, and he continued reluctantly. The report about the coming assault was given, but it wasn't believed. Losses were, well, very bad. Eve squeezed her eyes shut, feeling something rise in her throat. It was either a laugh or a scream. So it was all worth nothing. Lily giving up her freedom so that report could get through. Eve leaving Cameron's sleeping arms and walking back into mortal danger because such reports were worth risking her life for. All of it rendered useless. Nothing Eve or Lily or Violette had done had avoided the bloodbath. Nothing I did in France ever amounted to anything. His voice was fierce. No, do not think that. He would have seized her shoulders, but he sensed her recoil. The Alice Network saved hundreds, Eve, perhaps thousands. You were the best network in the war. None of the others in France or Belgium ever equaled it. Eve smiled, mirthless. Who cared about praise when the failures were so much bigger than the victories? That miracle chance in 15 to kill the Kaiser failed. Stopping the assault on Verdun failed. Keeping the network together after Lily's arrest failed. Cameron had gone on. I don't know if you've read Major Allenton's communications. He says you never responded. But you've been awarded these. He meant to award them to you at Louise's funeral. She received the same, posthumously. Eve refused to take the case, so after an awkward pause, Cameron opened it for her. Four medals glittered in Eve's blurring vision. The Medal de Guerre, the Croix de Guerre with Palm, the Croix de la Légion d'Honneur, on the order of the British Empire. Awarded in honor of your war efforts. Tin toys. Eve took a hand from her pocket at last and knocked them to the ground, trembling. I don't want any medals. Then Major Allenton will hold them for you. Cram them up his ass. Cameron gathered Eve's medals and dropped them back into the case. I didn't want mine either, believe me. But you had to take them, because you're still in the army. Eve gave a one-note bark of a laugh. The army doesn't want me anymore. I did my part and the war's over, so now they'll pin some b bits of tin on me and tell me to bugger off back to the file room. 
Well, they can keep their damned tin scraps. Cameron flinched this time at her language. His eyes dropped, and Eve realized she hadn't put her hand back in her pocket. His eyes went from her fingers to her face and back, as though he were seeing the demure, quiet-voiced girl he'd sent away to France with her carpet bag and her soft hands and her innocence. War and torture and prison and René Bordelon had happened, and now she was nothing like that girl. She was a damaged wreck of a woman with a foul mouth and destroyed hands and no innocence at all. Not your fault, Eve wanted to say to the guilty sorrow in his eyes. But he wouldn't believe her. She sighed, flexing her ruined fingers. You had to n n n n to know about these, she said. There was a report. Knowing's not the same as seeing. He reached out for the crippled hand, but stopped himself. She was glad. She didn't want to keep shoving him away. He hadn't earned that. He gave a sigh of his own instead. Let's get a drink. It was a horrible pub on the docks, the kind of place where gravel-voiced women slopped gin into grimy glasses for men who were already drunk at ten in the morning. But it was just what Eve needed. Anonymous, cheap, windowless, so she didn't worry about people sneaking up behind her. Two shots of gin, followed by a pint of bitter, steadied her jumping pulse. She used to be proud of that slow pulse that got her through danger, but it had been a long time since she'd held up that coolly under pressure. Maybe the last time was in René Bordelon's Greenwald study. René. She took another draught of beer, tasting hatred along with it. In Zeigburg, her hate had tasted bitter. Now it was a sweet thing, because now she could do something about it. The satchel at her feet held a luger, not her old luger with the scratch on the barrel, the one René had taken from her. But it would do. Cameron, for all his gentlemanly air, knocked the gin back as fast as Eve, giving a murmured toast of Gabriel. When Eve raised her eyebrows, he explained, Another of my recruits, shot in April of sixteen. I rotate them, the ones I lost. He raised his beer and said, Leon, before downing a swallow. Was I in your rotation? No, only those confirmed dead. Cameron's eyes had that terrible drowning softness again. Every week following your trial, I expected to get the news you died in Siegburg. After Lily, I almost did. They looked at each other a long time, and then they ordered another round of gin. Lily. They were both silent, until Cameron abruptly started saying something about a pension for Eve. You'll find it more useful than the medals. I knew you didn't have any family, so I pushed a pension for you through the war office. That's not much, but it'll keep you afloat. Maybe help you buy a house somewhere in London. Thank you. Eve didn't want the medals, but she'd take the pension. It wasn't like she'd be going back to typewriting with hands like hers. She needed something to live on. Cameron studied her. Your stammer's better. Go to prison, and you find there are worse things than a halting tongue. She took another draught of beer. And this helps. He set down his glass. Eve, if I can. So what are you going to do now? She cut him off fast, before he could say anything he'd regret. I was sent to Russia for a while, during their bit of upheaval. Siberia. The things I saw. He sat blank-faced for a moment, and Eve wondered what he was seeing through the curtain of remembered Russian snows. She didn't ask. It's Ireland next for me, he resumed. To run a training school... School for what? People like you? Who needs people like me anymore? The war's over. He laughed bitterly. There's always another war, Eve. Eve didn't even want to think about the next war, or a generation of new, fresh-faced spies who would be fed into its gaping mouth. At least they'd have a good teacher. When do you leave? Soon. Is your wife going? Yes. And our child. I'm glad you had, but that is, I know your wife wanted a ch child. How wearying these courtesies were. Eve felt like she was struggling under a boulder. What did you decide to name? 
he spoke softly. Evelyn. Eve stared down at the sticky tabletop. Why not Lily? She heard herself ask. Why not Gabrielle or any of your others? Why was it me, Cameron? If you could see yourself, you wouldn't ask. I can see myself. I'm a wreck. Nothing could wreck you, Eve. You've got a core of steel. Eve took a shaky breath. I'm sorry I d deceived you. Ran out when you were sleeping and went back to Lille when you didn't want me to return. Her voice was thick. I'm so sorry. I know. Eve looked down at the table where his hand lay next to her maimed one. He shifted a little so that his thumb grazed the tip of her nearest finger. I wish... Eve began and stopped. Wished what? That he wasn't married? Eve was too much of a mess to step into the place at his side, even if that place was empty. That they could find a bed and curl up together anyway. Eve couldn't bear to share a room with anyone. The nightmares were too bad. That they could go back a few years. To before. Before what? Zygborg? Lily? The war? I wish you were happy, she said at last. Cameron didn't lift her hand to his lips in the old gesture. He lowered his head to the tabletop instead, and pressed his worn mouth to her abused knuckles. I'm a broken down army officer, with a lot of dead recruits on my hands, Eve. I don't have it in me to be happy. You could resign from the army. I can't, really. Because as many dead as I've got behind me, there are more in front, waiting in Ireland to be trained. And I know I'll do better by them than asses like Allenton. He was more than halfway drunk, Eve realized. He'd never insulted a superior aloud before. I'm still useful, Cameron said, pronouncing his words carefully. I can go to Ireland and train up the next generation of cannon fodder, so that's what I'll do. I'll go on working until I can't anymore. Then I suppose I'll die. Or retire. Retirement kills people like us, Eve. That's how we die if the bullets don't get there first. He smiled bitterly. Bullets, boredom, or brandy. That's how people like us go. Because God knows we aren't made for peace. No, we aren't. Eve leaned down and pressed her own lips against his hand. And then they drank until it was time for Cameron's train. He held his liquor like an Englishman, glassy-eyed but still ramrod straight as they headed up the pier. I go to Ireland in a week. His voice was as bleak as if he were going to hell. What are you going? Back to France, as soon as possible. What's in France? An enemy. Eve looked up, brushing the dry wisps of hair out of her eyes, feeling the weight of the pistol in her satchel. René Bordelon, Cameron. I'm going to kill him if it's the last thing I do in this life. That was Eve's use, now that the war was done. Cameron's eyes puzzled her, a study in agony and indecision. Later, Eve would go over that look very carefully and realize just how well he'd pulled the wool over her eyes. Eve, he said at last. Didn't you know? René Bordelon is dead. Chapter 37 Charlie June 1947 I braced myself the next day for Eve's sarcasm, because absolutely no one could have looked at Finn and me and not known exactly what had happened. Both of us were heavy-eyed from lack of sleep. I couldn't keep a smile off my face, and Finn cast so many sideways glances at me, I was surprised he didn't tip the car in a ditch before we even got out of Grenoble. But Eve was silent from the moment she climbed into the Laganda. When I looked back at her, she was gazing off over the hills. And I liked that better than having her make trenchant comments about the way Finn and I covertly held hands in the front seat. What happens when we get to Kras? I tried asking her. An enigmatic smile. I groaned. You are so infuriating, you know that? But I couldn't stay cross. Finn's fingers twined through mine were rough and warm and I was so happy it nearly stunned me. I'd felt nothing but numbness for so long, and then felt the numbness shattered by grief and guilt and anger. Those things were still there, but they were overlaid now by this rich, quiet glow. It wasn't just the sleepless night we'd shared. It was the way Finn had gone downstairs for coffee while I sat combing my hair, and come back with not just coffee, 
but a plate of crisp bacon, charmed out of the hotel cook, all because he knew I was craving it. It was the way I'd looked at myself in the mirror and seen not the angry girl setting her chin at an angle that told the world I don't care, but a happy young woman with a French tan and a scatter of freckles. It was the face of someone who did care and was cared for in return. I shook my head slightly to disrupt my own thoughts. I didn't want to examine the happiness too closely. I was too afraid it would fall apart. I was content to let it be, never releasing Finn's hand, but turning around in my seat again as we drew nearer class, and having another go at Eve. Let's have it. How are we going to find Baudelon? I'm still turning my plan over for weak points, Yank, she replied. I know perfectly well I'm not entirely level on the subject of René. You mean not entirely seen? Finn muttered. I heard that, Scotsman. She didn't sound angry. I'm not all there, and we all know it, so I'm making sure this plan hasn't got holes, because this could easily get cocked up, and I have no intention of letting that happen. How can I help with this plan of yours? I asked. But Finn muttered something as Eve began to answer. What is it? That oil leak. He dropped my hand, pointing at a dial. Need to tighten a few things. We're only an hour from glass. I gave the convertible's dashboard a thump. This old bucket. Watch your tone, miss. She's an old lady, and she deserves a rest if she wants one. This car is not actually alive, Finn. Says you, lass. Finn eased the car off onto one of the side roads as we bickered. Who knew bickering could be so enjoyable? Green hills rose in the distance on all sides and the air had some heady fragrance I didn't recognize. Not far south was the sea, I thought. The lazy influence of the Mediterranean was rising fast in the air. Then I gave a breathless, Oh! as the Laganda finished the turn on the off-road and coasted to a stop. For a moment, all three of us stared. The slope below was a dazzling carpet of blue-purple spires, and the smell rose into the wind, intoxicatingly sweet. Hyacinths. Thousands upon thousands of hyacinths. I leaned so far over the door I nearly fell out, inhaling deeply. We must have driven onto one of the flower farms. Grasse was a capital for perfume makers. I already knew that. But I'd never seen the local flower fields that supplied the trade. I scrambled out of the car, leaving the door gaping, and leaned down to bury my nose in the nearest bank of blooms. The scent dizzied me. Farther down the slope, I could see swells of pink, rolling masses of roses. From even farther came the rich waft of jasmine. I looked back and saw Eve sitting very still, breathing in the scents. Saw Finn smiling as he fetched his toolbox. I couldn't resist plunging into the waves of blue, running my fingertips along the spires. It was like wading into a fragrant sapphire lake. Finn was closing the hood by the time I came running back. Eve! I called, and leaning over, I deposited an armload of hyacinths into her lap. For you! Eve looked at the mass of flowers, her tortured hands moving gently through the soft petals, and I felt my eyes prickle. You testy, stubborn, goddamn old bat, I do love you, I thought. She looked up at me, smiling a rather rusty smile, and I wondered if she was about to say something similarly affectionate. Here's the plan once we get get to class she said instead. I laughed. I should have known better than to expect a sentimental moment from Eve. Finn came up beside me, and she nodded at him. You'll need a sharp suit, Scotsman, and some business cards. You, Yank, will need to play my devoted granddaughter. And we'll all need patience, because this is going to take time. She outlined the rest in a few sentences. The two of us listened, nodding. Could work, Finn said. If Baudelon is in class to begin with. And if we find him? I asked. Eve smiled blandly. Why do you ask? Humor me. I was thinking of the conversation on the bridge last night, my gnawing fear that Eve wanted blood. I was not going to be a party to a murder. What are you going to do when you find him? Eve quoted in French. I shall come back to your bedroom and silently glide toward you with the shadows of the night. I shall give you kisses frigid as the moon, and the caresses of a serpent that slithers around a grave. I groaned. Let me guess, 
Baudelaire. My favorite poem, Le Revenant, the ghost, but it sounds better in French. Revenant comes from the verb revenir, to come back. He never thought I'd come back. He's going to be very wrong. Finn and I exchanged glances, and Eve turned brisk again. Back in the car, children. We can't gawp at the flowers all day. We motored into grass at twilight, a place of square towers, narrow, twisting roads, apricot roofs, and Mediterranean colors, and over everything the scent of the flower fields. Eve strode up to the hotel clerk and opened her mouth, but I forestalled her. Two rooms, I said, looking up at Finn. One for Grand Maman and one for us. Don't you think, dear? I said it without a hitch, laying a casual hand on his arm, so the clerk would see my wedding ring. As Eve had said, selling a story is done by reciting the little details without any flubs. Two rooms, Finn confirmed, slightly strangled. The clerk didn't bat an eye. Later, I put a telephone call to Violette in Roubaix, letting her know where to reach me. We were in Grasse, and the hunt was on. Finn's new cards were embossed and expensive looking. Pass them over with a patronizing air, Eve instructed. And for God's sake, will you two quit giggling? But Finn and I went on howling with laughter. The cards, in their impressive looking script, read, Donald McGowan, solicitor. My Donald, I managed to say at last. Well, my mother always did want me to catch a lawyer. Solicitor, Eve corrected. Limeys have solicitors, and very supercilious they are too. You'll have to work up a good frown, Finn. He had an impressive frown indeed as he handed his card across the maitre d' desk, about four days later. By then he'd had some practice. I am making inquiries on behalf of a lady, he murmured. A matter of some delicacy. The maitre d' appraised him in a glance. Finn Kilgore in his rumpled shirt and tousled hair wouldn't have gotten the time of day in Les Trois Cloches, one of Grasse's finest restaurants. But Donald McGowan, in his charcoal gray suit and narrow striped tie, rated a subtle straightening in posture. How may I be of assistance, monsieur? It was the slow hour between lunch and dinner, when diners were few. Eve always timed our arrival carefully, so the staff had time to gossip, or answer questions. My client, Mrs. Knight, Finn glanced back to where Eve stood in a black silk dress and broad-brimmed hat, her hands hidden by kid gloves, leaning on my arm, looking frail as she dabbed her eyes with a black bordered handkerchief. She emigrated to New York years ago, but much of her family remained in France, Finn explained. And with so many dead in the war. The maitre d' crossed himself. So many. I have found death records for her father, her aunt, two uncles but a cousin is still missing. If you can traipse all over France looking for your missing cousin, then so can I, Eve had said when she told us where she got the idea. Who in Europe doesn't have a missing cousin or two these days? We discovered he fled Limoges for Grasse in 44, just ahead of the Gestapo. Finn lowered his voice, dropping a few vague hints about resistance activity and enemies in Vichy, painting a vision of Eve's childhood companion. Brave patriot narrowly escaping arrest, now yearned for by Eve, lonely survivor of a massacred family. Will anyone fall for that? I'd asked back in the Hyacinth field. It's very Hollywood. They'll fall for it because it's Hollywood. After a war like this one, everyone wants a happy ending, even if it's not their own. Sure enough, this maitre d', like the ones before him, was nodding, clearly sympathetic. René de Malassie. Finn said, winding up. But he may have taken a different name. The Melis were looking for him. A trade of grimaces. Even two years after the war, everybody bristled at the mention of the Melis. And this has made Mrs. Knight's inquiries very difficult. But we do have a photograph. The photograph of René, folded and clipped so all his swastika-wearing dinner partners would not show, was pushed discreetly across the table. The maitre d' studied it. Eve allowed her shoulders to shake, and I patted her back, looking worried. Call maman, don't upset yourself. My role here, to ramp up the sympathy factor. 
I chafed Eve's gloved hand between my own, heart thudding as the maitre d' hesitated. No, he said, shaking his head, and my heart thudded again more leadenly. No, I'm afraid I don't recognize the gentleman. I crossed Les Trois Cloches off the list as Finn slid a discreet banknote across the table, with a murmured, if you see the gentleman, do contact me. Only a few hundred more places to go. Don't look dejected, Eve said once we were outside. I said this would take legwork and luck, d- didn't I? This is the part that isn't Hollywood. You don't just go looking for someone and have him pop up like a rabbit out of a magician's hat. You're certain this is the best way to locate him? Finn asked, donning his fedora. No more striding about hatless for him. Donald McGowan, solicitor, was a good deal more businesslike. One of these places, Eve gave a whack to the crumpled list in her bag, will know him. Her argument was simple. René Baudelon prized the finer things of life. Whatever else had changed, that wouldn't have. He'd still patronize the best clubs, drink at the best cafes, attend the best theaters. And he was the kind of patron the staff noticed, because he tipped and dressed well, and could talk wine with the sommelier and climped with the museum guide. We had a relatively recent photograph. If we canvassed the best culture spots in Grasse, Eve argued, someone would recognize that face. Then we'd have a name. Standing on that sunny day among the flowers, I'd wondered, how long is this going to take? If it were Paris, forever. But Grasse isn't enormous. Finn had worried about something more sinister. What if he finds out a woman is looking for him? A woman with mangled hands? About the age his little Marguerite would be now. Eve glowered. I'm a professional, Finn. Give me some credit. You think I'm going to march all over Grass with a horn announcing my presence? Hence Mrs. Knight and Mr. McGowan, and the gloves concealing Eve's hands. One condition, Gardner, Finn replied. You leave that Luger in the hotel room. You think if I saw René Baudelot on the streets of Grass, I'd walk up and put a bullet into his brain? I'm no dunderhead. I won't take the chance. Four days now we'd been at it. We were barely unpacked in our hotel before Eve was gathering information, compiling lists. And as soon as Finn had his business cards and his suit, and Eve had a good pair of gloves and a dowager hat that hid her face, without looking like it was trying to hide her face, out we'd sallied. I was almost too nervous to speak the first time we sailed into a high-end cafe with our prepared story. Now, six restaurants, three museums, one theater, five clubs, and four days later, it was almost boring. Except for the moment of liquid anticipation every time a new concierge or waiter leaned over René's photograph, and I thought maybe, this time. Welcome to real spy work, Eve said outside Les Trois Cloches, transforming before my eyes as she straightened from her old lady hobble. Mostly tedious, occasionally exhilarating. Her eyes sparkled, and I thought how much better she looked than the day I met her. Then she could have been sixty or seventy, harrowed and lined and pale. Now she'd shaken off the slump of grief and inactivity that made her seem old and fragile. And I was astounded at the change. Her face had healthy color again, even if there were still harsh lines graven about eyes and mouth. She moved with swift efficiency rather than a defensive hunch. Her graying hair had a gleam to it, like her sharp eyes. She looked her age again, fifty-four, with plenty of vigor left. She hasn't had one of her screaming nightmares since we got here, I commented to Finn after dinner that night, watching Eve head upstairs. And she's not slamming back as much whiskey. The chase is good for her. Finn finished his after-dinner coffee. She's a hunter at heart. The past thirty years she's been standing still. Dying slowly with nothing to pursue. Maybe it's not a bad thing if this hunt lasts a while. Well, I said, I certainly wouldn't mind that. He gave me that invisible smile that turned my knees to water. I'm pure done in from all this tromping about. You. Exhausted. We should make it an early night. But there wasn't much sleeping being done in our little room, with its blue shutters and wide, soft bed. Neither Finn nor I objected when Eve's search expanded to a week, ten days. The mornings were for the three of us, flaky croissant and cups of ink-dark espresso, at a table so small our knees jammed together. 
Then the hunt, the repetition of our now seamless play, stopping at a shop for handmade shoes off the Place aux Airs. Then an atelier for expensive cologne, strolling through the narrow, twisting streets of the Vieille Ville, headed for clubs and theaters that might recognize a favorite patron. And finally, during the sleepy hour before dinner, visiting restaurants full of shaded lamps and heavy silver cutlery. Finally back to the hotel and supper, passing a bottle of Provençal Rosé over plates of heaped frites. Those were the days, and Finn and I were content to let Eve direct them, because the nights were ours. Have I mentioned, I asked one night, my head against Finn's arm, that you look absolutely jaw-dropping in a three-piece suit? I you have. It seemed worth repeating. I leaned over to tip out the last of the wine we'd brought up to bed. I was completely naked, no longer even slightly self-conscious in front of him, as he lay with his hands clasped behind his head, admiring me. When do we get the Lagonda back? Maybe another week. Upon learning we'd be in Grasse a while, Finn made arrangements to have that elusive leak repaired. He telephoned every other day to check on his precious car like an anxious mother. You need a new car, Finn. You know what a new car costs these days. What was the wartime metal drive? Here's to the Lagonda's health, then. I passed him the mug we were using for a wine glass. I wouldn't mind driving around class instead of walking everywhere. My feet hurt, and I was counting on a few more months before I get enormous enough for aching feet. As soon as we'd arrived in class, my morning sickness had dropped away, and so had my perpetual draining tiredness. I didn't know if it was the flower-scented breezes, or all the lovemaking, or just that the rosebud was into her fourth month now. But suddenly I felt marvelous, full of boundless energy and ready for anything, even the endless walking all over class. But I still missed the car. Finn drained the last of the rosé, then wriggled around so he was sitting with his back against the footboard. He started massaging my toes under the sheet, and I wriggled pleasurably. The night was warm. We had all the shutters open and the smell of jasmine and roses drifted in. The lamplight encircled the bed, turning it into a ship adrift on a dark sea. By agreement, we didn't talk about René here, or the war, or any of the terrible things that had happened because of either. The nighttime hours belonged to happier conversations. Wait until you're eight months in, Finn predicted, massaging my arches. That's when the feet really start to hurt. What would you know about eight months in, Mr. Kilgore? Watching all my friends' wives. I'm about the only one not hitched. First thing most of my mates in the 63rd did once they got home was knock up some girl and marry her. I'm a godfather at least three times over. I can just see you standing over a font with a screaming armful of lace. Screaming? Never. Babies like me. Go right to sleep the minute I pick them up. A pause. I like bairns. Always wanted a few. We let that hang in the air a moment before tiptoeing around it. What else do you like? I asked, giving him my other foot. Besides Bentley's. Last night he'd read aloud out of his motoring magazine the entire mechanical rundown of the Bentley Mark VI, aping my American accent outrageously as I pummeled him with a pillow. A man with a Bentley has everything he needs, lass except maybe a good garage to keep her in fighting trim. The one that's got the Lagonda now, they're good. I tickled his chest with my toes. You could run a place like that, you know. Got to be good with more than cars to run a garage. He made a rueful face. You know me. The bank book would end up under an oil can, and you'd never read the check stubs for engine grease. And soon the banks would own it all. Not if I were the one keeping the books. I didn't finish the thought even to myself, just released it gently and told him instead about the Provençal Café I remembered so well, how that long ago day had made striped awnings and Edith Piaf and goat cheese sandwiches my idea of heaven on earth. Though an English breakfast should be featured, in the ideal café, that is. Well, I do a bro one pan fry up. We both knew what we were doing here, during these lazy nighttime conversations. We were outlining a future and tentatively, almost fearfully, starting to sketch each other into it, then backing away from the unspoken with half-smiles. Sometimes the night brought bad dreams for one of us, 
but nightmares were easier to bear when there were warm arms in the dark to burrow into. When grief came for either of us, it wound its way through the night and became part of the sweetness. I haven't known you for long enough to be this crazy about you, I thought, watching Finn's profile in the soft light. But I am. One afternoon, two and a half weeks into our stay, Eve said over a post-lunch espresso, Maybe Renée isn't here. Finn and I traded glances, both doubtless thinking of all the head-shaken no over the photograph since we'd arrived. Three restaurant managers and an expensive tailor had thought they recognized the face, but couldn't remember the name that went with it. Otherwise, nothing. Maybe I should give it up. Let Charlie here go back home to knit booties and have you... Eve nodded at Finn. Take me back to the land of fish and chips. Can't say I'm ready to go home yet. I kept my voice light, but Finn squeezed my hand and I squeezed back. Let's give it another week or two, Finn said. Eve nodded. But let's take the afternoon off. I want to amble over to the garage and check on the Lagonda. He's going to harangue those poor mechanics to death. Eve chuckled as he walked away. Or apologize to the car for not visiting more often, I agreed. We sat for a while, finishing our espressos, and then Eve looked at me. I'm no good at afternoons off. Let's pick a few restaurants. I reckon the two of us can brace the waiters without our solicitor in tow. I looked at her, gray eyes gleaming in her tanned face as she clapped her big hat over her brow at a rakish angle. Maybe you should introduce me as your daughter this time. You're not so plausible as my old granny anymore. Pshaw, sure. I'm serious. It's this flowery air and glass. It's like the elixir of youth. As we strolled through the oldest part of the city, where the buildings arched overhead, leaning on each other like friendly shoulders, I realized I loved Grasse. All the other cities we'd passed through, Lille, Roubaix, Limoges, had been blurred for me by the search for Rose. But here in Grasse, we'd finally stopped to breathe, and the city was unfolding to me like the jasmine blossoms in the fields. I never want to leave this place, I thought, before pulling myself back to the search at hand. Two unsuccessful restaurant stops later, Eve pulled out her map to search for a third. I munched a concoction of fried courgette flowers, to which the rosebud had become almost as addicted as bacon, eyeing a nearby shop window. The display was all children's clothes, sailor suits, ruffled skirts, and laid out across a display pram, a tiny lacy baby dress embroidered in rose vines. I looked at that dress and had an attack of utter lust. I could see the rosebud wearing it at her christening. I could feel her now. In what felt like a matter of days, I'd gone from utterly flat in front to just a little rounded. You couldn't see it through my clothes, but it was there, that tiny bump. Finn didn't say anything, but he kept running his fingertips over my abdomen at night. Butterfly touches like kisses. Buy it, Eve said, noticing my stare. That armload of lace you're drooling over. Just buy it. I doubt I can afford it. Wistfully, I swallowed my last fried flour. I bet it costs more than all my secondhand clothes put together. Eve crammed her map into her handbag, marched into the shop, and emerged minutes later with a brown paper package that she tossed me unceremoniously. Maybe now you'll pick up the pace. You didn't have to. I hate being thanked. March, Yank. I marched. You're spending a lot lately, Eve. The money from my pawned pearls had run out, and Eve was now covering all our expenses, though I'd sworn to repay her as soon as I could crack my bank account open in London. What have I got to spend it on? Whiskey, vengeance, and baby dresses. I grinned, hugging the package. Would you be her godmother? Keep saying her, and it'll come out a boy just to spite you. His godmother, then. I paused, suddenly serious, though I'd said it flippantly. Really, Eve, would you? I don't behave well in church. I'm counting on it. All right. She gave me a rusty smile, then stalked on like a heron through deep water. If you insist, I do insist, I said, and the words came out thick with emotion. The restaurant was just off the Place de Petit Puy, with its white-fronted cathedral. It was long past the lunch hour, 
Diners would be trickling in soon for early evening drinks. I blinked at the dimness inside after the dazzling sun, mentally shifting back to my role of devoted family attendant, just as Eve was already drooping against me, as though too frail to walk unsupported. I stepped to the maître d' and went into Finn's spiel, which I could have recited in my sleep. Eve dabbed at her eyes, and soon I was pushing the photograph across the table. My mind was on the baby dress. I wasn't really thinking of our quarry. And then I was, because the maître d' nodded in recognition. That nod hit me like a hammer blow. Bien sûr, mademoiselle. I know the gentleman well, or one of our favored patrons, Monsieur René Gauthier. For an instant, I froze. René Gauthier. The name reverberated around my skull like a ricocheting bullet. René Gauthier. Eve stepped up beside me. How she hung on to her quivery fragility, I had no idea. But she had won four medals for spying. I saw why as she quavered, without stammering or batting an eye. Oh, monsieur, how happy you've made me. My René. It's been so many years since I've seen him. René Gauthier. That's the name he's taken? Yes, madame. The maître d' smiled, clearly savoring his chance to be the bearer of good news. Eve was right. After a war, everyone wanted a happy ending. He has a charming little villa outside Grasse, but he comes here frequently. For the Riette de Canard, we serve the finest Riettes on the Riviera, if I do say so myself. I didn't care about the goddamn Riette. I leaned in closer, pulse racketing. His villa. Would you have an address? Just past the mimosa fields of the Rue des Papillons, mademoiselle. We sometimes deliver a crate of wine. A vouvray one can get nowhere else in Grasse. Eve was already straightening her hat. Thank you, monsieur. You have made us very happy, I gabbled, reaching for Eve's arm. But the maître d' looked past us and beamed. Ah, what luck. Here is monsieur now. Chapter 38 Eve As she turned to face her enemy, time folded in on itself. It was both 1915 and 1947. She was 22, bloodied and broken. And she was 54, shaking and still broken. René Baudelon was a suave, dark-haired bon vivant. And he was this stiff-shouldered old man with silver hair and an exquisitely tailored suit. At that instant, while time crashed together, both versions were true. Then past and present merged with a click, and it was only 1947, a beautiful summer evening in Grasse, and an old spy stood separated from her old enemy by nothing more than a few feet of tiled floor. As Eve looked at him, tall and stork-boned, the same silver-headed cane hooked over one arm, terror opened like a trapdoor in her stomach and all her patched-together courage shattered in one long, silent shriek. He did not recognize her. He rotated his black homburg in his hands, raising an eyebrow at the maître d's eager expression. I am expected, I see. A shudder racked Eve at the sound of the inflectionless voice of her nightmares. Her hands ached inside her gloves as she gazed, numb with disbelief, at the man who had broken them. She had never imagined she might encounter him before she was ready. She thought she could manage their first meeting on her own terms, surprise him when she was well prepared. Instead, fate had surprised her, and she was not prepared at all. He had not changed. The hair gone silver, the lines at the forehead, those were just window dressing. The spider's fingers, the even voice, cheap soul of a torturer peeping out from behind the expensive suit of a sophisticate, that was all the same. Except the scar on his lip, Eve's mark, she realized, left when she'd bitten him in their last venomous kiss. The maître d' was chattering explanations, and dimly Eve felt Charlie touching her elbow, murmuring something she couldn't hear through the buzzing in her ears. She knew she should say something, do something, but she could only stand frozen. René's dark eyes returned to her face, and he stepped forward. Mrs. Knight, I don't recognize the name, madame. Eve had no idea how she managed it, but she stepped to meet him, holding out her hand. He took it, 
and the old revulsion swamped her at his familiar long-fingered grip. She wanted to fling his hand away and flee like a coward, keening her old terror and agony. Too late. He was here. So was she. And Evelyn Gardner was done running. She squeezed his hand hard and saw his face change as he felt the deformities covered by her glove. She leaned forward so only he could hear her voice. The words came low, calm, perfectly even. Perhaps you'll recognize the name Marguerite Le François, René Baudelon. Or should I say, Evelyn Gardner. The restaurant was suddenly making a great fuss. They had a happy reunion under their roof. Waiters beamed and the maitre d' offered the best table in the house. And in the middle of all the hubbub, Eve and René held each other in a gaze like an exchange of swords. Finally, the bastard dropped her hand and gestured toward the table the waiters were so cheerfully preparing. Shall we? Eve managed to incline her head. She turned, wondering how she was able to walk without stumbling. Charlie came to her side like a knight squire, her face white as she took Eve's elbow. That fierce little hand was wonderfully steadying. Eve! she murmured, eyes darting at the man behind them. What can I do? Keep out of the way, Eve managed to mutter back. This dueling ground was no place for Charlie Sinclair. René would swat her as casually as he had swatted and maimed so many others in passing. Eve would claw him to pieces before she allowed him to hurt anyone else she cared for. Claw him to pieces? Her mind sneered. You can barely look him in the eye but she shoved that aside along with her terror and sat down opposite him, an expanse of snowy linen stretching between them. Charlie perched on a chair at Eve's side, uncharacteristically mute. The waiters were well trained, hovering out of earshot to give this happy reunion its privacy. René leaned back and steepled his fingertips. Eve had a sick flash, seeing those fingers curled around the blood-stained bust of Baudelaire, seeing them trace her naked breasts in bed. Well, he said softly in French. Marguerite. Her pulse nearly stopped, hearing that name from his lips. But her old coolness came back with her old identity, sweeping over her in a wave. Her blood beat slow and cold, and for the first time since she turned to find him standing in the restaurant entryway, she looked at the poisonous old man with some semblance of calm. René Gautier, she replied. After Théophile Gautier, I presume, the poet to whom Baudelaire dedicated the flowers of evil. In Limoges, you were de Malassie, after Baudelaire's publisher. So I see you still haven't found another poet. René shrugged as casually as though this were any ordinary dinner conversation. Why not stay with the best, once one has found it? A fancy way of saying you have a stagnant mind. A waiter gushed up and presented a bottle of champagne. Since it is a reunion worthy of celebration, monsieur. It is at that, René murmured. Why not? I could use a drink, Eve agreed. A whiskey the size of a bucket would have been better, but she'd take champagne. She knotted her hands into fists in her lap, realizing, as the champagne cork popped and René twitched, that he was not as cool inside as he pretended. Good. In unison, they reached for their glasses as the waiter retreated. No one suggested a toast. So many lines on that face, he said. What have you been doing with yourself all these years? Living hard. I don't need to ask what you've been doing. Pretty much what you were doing the last time we met. Living well, aiding Germans, getting your countrymen shot. Though now you're not opposed to doing the shooting yourself. Lost your squeamishness in your old age. It's thanks to you that I lost my squeamishness, pet. The word ran over her skin like a rat. I was never your pet. Does Judas suit you better? That hit hard, but Eve managed, barely, not to flinch. About as well as dupe suits you. He gave a tight smile. As Eve watched him lounging in his expensive suit, his long nose appreciating the fizz of his perfectly chilled champagne. Fury began to build. So many had died. Lily in her squalid prison. Charlie's cousin and her baby in a hail of bullets. 
a young sous chef with a pocket full of stolen silver. And this man had spent those years doing what? Drinking champagne and sleeping without nightmares? Eve's nightmares had not begun until after Ziegburg, in her prison cell, shivering in an agony of cold on an unwashed pallet. There were no dreams. But afterward, there were horror images of the green-walled study, the evil-eyed lilies, the descending bust. The room, never the man. Dreaming of that room where he'd broken her had given the lines around her eyes that he studied so contemptuously. He looked like he'd spent the last thirty years sleeping very well. Eve caught a glimpse of Charlie's face, pale and immobile, when she was usually so animated, and wondered if the Yank was thinking the same thing. She remembered Charlie saying that she'd never faced evil as Eve had. You are facing it now. René took another sip, made a small sound of appreciation, and patted his lips with a napkin. I confess I'm surprised to see you, Marguerite. May I call you Marguerite? I never really managed to think of you any other way. I'm surprised you thought of me at all. You never were one to look back at the wreckage in your wake. Well, you were unique. I thought you might turn up in Limoges looking for me after the First War. If not for Cameron's lie. You covered your tracks rather well when you left Lille for Limoges. New identification papers aren't difficult to manage when one already has black market connections. A wave of his hand. You might still have found me once they let you out of Zeigburg. I did keep an eye out for news of your release. Why such a delay tracking me down? Does it matter? Eve slugged half a champagne in a single swallow. She was finding her words faster, the old back-and-forth rhythm she used to play so well against René in their conversations. I'm here now. To shoot me between the eyes. I believe you'd have done that in the doorway if you had a weapon. May goddamn Finn Kilgore to hell, Eve thought. If not for him, she'd have been carrying her Luger. If that broken mess she call her hand can still fire pistols, that is. René summoned a waiter with a lifted finger. The Rue de Canard. I find myself hungry. Uh, certainly, monsieur. And for madame... No, thank you. Your stammer's improved, René said once the waiter retreated. Does it go away when you're afraid? When I'm angry. Eve smiled. When you get angry, you get a tiny tick at the corner of your eye. I can see it now. I think you're the only woman who has ever made me lose my temper, Marguerite. Small victories. Do you still have that bust of Baudelaire? I treasure it. At night, sometimes, I hear the sound of your fingers breaking, and I go to sleep with a smile. A flash of the green-walled study, the smell of blood and fear, but Eve shoved it aside. When I need to sleep, I think of your face the moment you realized you were being fucked by a spy. He never blinked, but something behind his eyes tightened. Eve's scalp shrank, but she smiled again, bolting the rest of her champagne and pouring more. I still know how to get to you, you old bastard. I suppose you want revenge, René said abruptly. Revenge is the consolation prize of the losing side. My side won, but you lost. So how do you intend to get your revenge, Marguerite? I don't believe you have the nerve for murder. That broken, piss-stained little thing I last saw sobbing her heart out of my obusson couldn't so much as lift her head much less a pistol. Eve flinched deep in her bones. She had been that broken, piss-stained little thing for more than thirty years in many ways, until a knock on her door one damp London night, barely a month ago, until the audible click in the front of the restaurant today, where past and present united. Until now. She would not be that broken, piss-stained little thing again. Ever. René was still talking, Perhaps you think you can disgrace me, turn me as a profiteer. I'm a respected man in grass, with powerful friends. You're a half-mad crone, gone crazed from grief. Who do you think will be believed? You're the man who informed against Oradour Soglan. Charlie's voice dropped into the conversation like a chunk of ice. Eve looked at her, startled. 
Don't speak. Don't draw his notice. But Charlie went on, eyes burning like coals. You're responsible for the massacre of 600 souls. I don't care how many powerful friends you have, you old bastard. France will not forgive that. Rene's eyes went over Charlie's face, lingering, but he still spoke to Eve. Who's this little thing then, Marguerite? Not a daughter or granddaughter, I think. That shriveled old cunt of yours surely never produced anything this pretty. Eve didn't respond. She looked at Charlie instead, feeling the squeeze of an unfamiliar emotion inside. Perhaps love. Call her Mercury, René. The winged messenger who came knocking at my door. She's the reason I'm sitting here. She's the reason you won't get away this time. She's your downfall. Eve raised her champagne in salute. Meet Charlotte Sinclair. His brow creased. I don't know the name. You know my cousins. Charlie's fingers tightened so hard around her champagne flute, Eve was surprised it didn't shatter. Rose Fournier, also going by the name of Hélène Joubert. She was blonde and lovely, and she worked for you in Limoges. And you got her killed, you son of a bitch. You gave her name to the milice because you were afraid she might be spying on you. And she died with nearly every other soul in orador sur -Glan. The waiter chose that moment to arrive with the Riette de Canard. René continued to look at Charlie thoughtfully as he unfolded his napkin, smeared a toast point with duck fat pâté, and consumed it with another small sound of appreciation. I remember her, he said at last when the waiter glided away. The little bitch who liked to eavesdrop. I take a dim view of nosy waitresses. A glance at Eve. Never let it be said I don't learn from the past. Why didn't you just fire her? The words rasped as if they were scraping out of Charlie's throat. Why did you turn her in? Just to be safe. And to be blunt, because it pleased me. I have a great antipathy now for spying women. A shrug. But I hope you aren't blaming me for the death of the entire village. That would be astoundingly poor logic. I am hardly at fault for some German general choosing to so thoroughly exceed protocol. I blame you for her death, Charlie whispered. You didn't know if she was resistance or not, and you still reported her. She could have been innocent and you didn't care. You bastard. Quiet, child. The adults are speaking. René reached for another toast point. More champagne, Marguerite. I believe we're done here. Eve drained her flute and rose. Come along, Charlie. The girl froze. Eve could see her trembling, knew the kind of rage that gripped her, how she wanted to hurl herself across the table and saw that old throat open with a butter knife. Eve understood that feeling very well. Not yet, Yank. Not just yet. Charlie. Eve's voice cracked like a whip. The girl rose, visibly shaking. She looked at René, calmly sitting there with duck fat glistening on his lips. And she whispered, we're not done yet. Yes, we are. He talked past her to Eve. If I see you again, you rattled bitch, or here you are trying to find my home or blacken my reputation, I will have you arrested for harassment. I'll consign you to oblivion and go back to a life where I never have to think of you. You think of me constantly, Eve said. The thought of me gnaws at you every day because I'm walking proof you never were as clever as you thought you were. His eyes flared. You're a turncoat who betrayed her own, thanks to a spoonful of opium. But I still fooled you blind, and that's been eating you alive for thirty years. The mask fell at last, and Eve saw raw fury. His eyes burned as though he could fell her dead on the spot, and she gave a slow, contemptuous smile. They did not move just exchanged their dueling gazes in venomous stillness, as waiters exchanged puzzled looks. This was clearly not the happy reunion they had thought to see. Au revoir. Eve reached over to his plate, picked up a toast point, ate it slowly. I must lie down where all the ladders start, in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. That's not Baudelaire, he said. Yates. I told you to find another poet. Eve picked up her hat. 
and that foul rag and bone shop you call a hard René. Take the time to admit you are afraid, because your fleur du mal has come back. She took Charlie's arm in a grip like steel and turned for the door. Sleep on that. Chapter 39 Charlie I stopped outside the restaurant and stood gulping for air, as though I'd just stumbled out of a poison cloud. I could still hear that flat, metallic voice telling me he'd reported Rose to her death, just to be safe. That it had pleased him. Eve had described him so often, the unwavering eyes, the long fingers, the elegant surface, but she had not done him justice. That hadn't been a man sitting across the table from me. It had been a human viper. I wanted to be sick, but Eve moved past me, heading down the street nearly at a run, and I forced myself into motion. Eve, we don't have to run. Dashing to catch up. He's not coming after you. No. Eve never stopped. I'm going off to him. For an instant, my heart howled agreement. I thought of that man, and I didn't feel any of the queasiness I'd experienced when I first realized Eve's revenge might be murderous. Half a glass of champagne in René Baudelon's company would be enough to convince anyone that sometimes even old men deserve to die. But common sense struggled through the red haze of fury, and my heart lurched. Eve, wait! You can't risk it! You... hurry up! She kept striding, blazing-eyed through the twisting streets. A tall Frenchman took one look at her expression and stepped out of her way. My mind raced, pulled in two directions. Stop her! Common sense argued, even as rage screamed, why? Turning the last corner, I saw the Laganda in front of our hotel, blue and gleaming. I sagged in relief. I needed Finn, his calm, his quiet logic, and if all else failed, his implacable arms keeping Eve from charging into disaster. But he wasn't beside his beloved car, and inside the desk clerk passed me a note covered in his black, slanting scroll. He went out to have drinks with the garage mechanic, I said, replying to Eve's look of brusque inquiry. They're offering him a job, something about engine restoration. Good. Eve took the stairs two at a time. I crammed a note in my pocket and followed. The desk clerk called after me. Madame, a telegram for you from Roubaix. I'll come back for it, I flung over my shoulder. By the time I burst into Eve's room, she already had the lucre out of the bedside drawer. The sight of it stopped me dead. Shit, I said for the first time in my life. Eve gave a grim smile as she peeled off her gloves. You cannot possibly be surprised. I pressed my fingers against my pounding temples. Fury was definitely giving way to fear. You'll go to his house and kill him then? Just wait till he comes home from slurping up Riette? Walk up to his door and put seven shots into his skull? Yes. She pushed the first bullet home. A charming little villa, the waiter said. Just past the mimosa fields off the Rue des Papillons. Shouldn't be hard to find. I folded my arms across my chest. Put that pistol down and listen to me. Whether you succeed or fail, you'll go to prison. Don't you understand that? I don't care. I do. I seized her by the arm. I want my daughter to have a godmother. She slid the last bullet into place. And I want to see that man dead. Part of me agreed, but his life wasn't worth trading for Eve's future. He'd already eaten too much of her past, and I wasn't going to risk ruining my own future, just as it was starting to be patched together by assisting in a murder. Eve, stop and think. I have. Eve checked the Luger's barrel. If I kill René at his home, there shouldn't be any witnesses. He hasn't got a wedding ring, so there's no wife or children to get in the way. I intend to leave his rotten body on the floor and walk out free as a bird. The restaurant knows you were looking for him, asking where he lived. Not just the restaurant today, either. We've been making inquiries all over Grasse for weeks. Maybe logic would reach her. I scrambled to marshal my arguments. If he turns up dead now, the police might look for us, but how? We all gave false names, to the hotel here and everyone else. Besides, I don't intend to stay in Grasse long enough for people to come looking for me. And how are you getting out of Grasse, with Finn not here to drive? 
How are you even getting to René's house first? Cab, if necessary. She sounded so calm, as though she were planning tea. In the restaurant, I'd sensed the fear behind the ice, seen her hands trembling in her lap under the table. Now she soared in some place far above fear, remote and relentless as a gliding eagle. Tossing the pistol into her satchel, Eve kicked out of the pump she was wearing as respectable Mrs. Knight and thrust her feet into her old sandals. Come help me kill him if you like. You have a right to want him dead too. No, I won't help you murder that man. You don't think he deserves to die? He does. But I want something worse than death for him. I want to see him exposed, humiliated, imprisoned. I want him held up to the world so they can see what he really is. That will kill him slowly, Eve. The worst punishment in the world for a man as proud as that. I took a deep breath, willing her to hear me. Let's go to the police. We have the photograph of him surrounded by Nazis. We have your testimony. We can call on the women in Limoges who saw him shoot that sous chef in cold blood. René Baudelot might have powerful friends, but so do you. You're a war heroine. People will believe you. So turn him in and make his life a living hell. For me, that would be good enough, to see that man in a cell, knowing he'd been put there by Eve and me, suffering the public abuse of de Gaulle's France that held collaborators and profiteers in as much contempt as vermin. No more chilled champagne and rillette, just humiliation and the kind of gray prison days Eve had suffered. He'll never sit in a cell, Yank. Eve's voice was implacable. René Baudelon has made a career of avoiding consequences. If we accuse a respected local man with money and powerful friends, it will take time to prove those accusations. He'll use that time to wrap it because he always runs. He's outrun the bad decisions of two wars, and he'll run now because he knows I won't stop coming for him. If I rely on an arrest warrant, he'll be gone before it comes to his door, and he'll resettle somewhere I'll never find him. She picked up the satchel with her luger. So I'll rely on a bullet. I wanted to throttle her. Don't you see how many ways that could go wrong? He could easily shoot you, or call the police and see you carried off in handcuffs. I'll take the risk. She looked down at me as I stepped between her and the door. Out of my way, Charlie Sinclair. I looked her right in the eye. No. She started toward me. I didn't try to push her back. I wrapped my arms around her and held fast. Are you going to drag me down the stairs, screaming every step of the way? I said, and realized I was near tears. I won't let go, Eve. I won't. I'd lost my brother. I'd lost Rose. I wasn't losing anyone else I loved. Eve went stiff in my arms as though she was about to fight. But then she sagged. I heard the glottal sound of a sob tearing loose from her throat, and then the satchel slid to the floor. We stood there a long time as Eve wept, as the sky and the open window behind her turned purple with twilight. I just held her, relief shuddering inside my chest. She wouldn't say anything at all when the tears dried up. She let me persuade her to lie down, took the whiskey I poured, shivering now and then under the blanket I laid over her. I sat by the bed nibbling my thumbnail, wishing silently for Finn. He knew better than I how to take care of her in these moods. I heard her breathing deepen and tiptoed downstairs to the hotel front desk. But they had no idea where Finn had gone with his mechanic friend. Your telegram, madame, the clerk reminded me. From Roubaix. I'd completely forgotten. It had to be from Violette. My heart was suddenly pounding for entirely new reasons as I snatched the paper. The words were terse, even for a telegram. Lie confirmed. A Mademoiselle Tellier responsible. Golden choirs erupted in my head. I felt ten feet tall. I'd been right in my suspicions. I'd been right. For once, I had it in my hands, the power to fix what was broken. This, this was what Eve needed. I sprinted back to her room, heart pounding. Eve, look! The door gaped open. The bed stood empty. The satchel with the luger was gone. I hadn't even been gone five minutes. 
She must have been up and moving the minute I tiptoed out, as cool and collected as she'd been shaking and crying just moments before. Fear roared through me again, hammering at my temples like spikes of ice. I ran to the open window, searching the street below, but I saw no tall, gaunt figure. You sneaky bitch, I thought in a wave of fury, at her for tricking me, and at myself for being tricked. I knew where she was going. I couldn't telephone the police, and I couldn't wait for Finn. The Lagonda sat at the curb below. I stuffed Violet's telegram into my pocket, snatched the car keys from the bedside table in my room, and ran. Chapter 40 Eve It was, Eve supposed, a dirty trick. Faster, she told the cab driver, tossing a handful of francs into the front seat. She didn't care if she spent every coin she had. She wouldn't need any for a journey back. The cab sped along as Eve sat relishing the comforting weight of the Luger in her lap, her eyes dry. All those crocodile tears, easily shed and just as easily wiped away. Underhanded and unscrupulous, but she'd seen no other option as she looked at Charlie standing implacably between her and the door, soft mouth set in a firm line. Eve smiled. What a different girl from the truculent, uncertain little thing she'd first found on her doorstep. I'm sorry I won't ever see you again, she thought. I am so sorry for that. You look very serious this evening, madame, the cab driver said, jocular. Didn't you say you are going to visit a friend? Yes. A long visit? Very. Eternal, in fact. Eve had no intention of leaving René Baudelon's house once she entered it. That was the reason she didn't fear prison. A dead woman couldn't be put behind bars. The Luger held seven shots. Six were for René. And it might take all six. Evil men clung hard to life. The last shot Eve was saving for herself. Just like you, Cameron, she murmured aloud, not seeing the darkening streets of grass slipping by. Instead, she saw a grainy headline from a newspaper clipping. Soldier's death. When had that been? Twenty-two? No, twenty-four. The words had stabbed Eve through a massive hangover. Concerning the death of Major C.A. Cameron, the world had disconnected. Eventually, Eve had managed to pick up the clipping again, from an overseas paper, mailed to her by a solicitor, and read through dry, burning eyes. There was a strangled sound, and it took her a moment to realize it was coming from her own throat. Death of Major C.A. Cameron of the Royal Field Artillery, who died at Sheffield Barracks as the result of a revolver wound. The coroner returned a verdict of suicide. Cameron dead. Cameron with his warm eyes and his Scottish lilt. Cameron kissing her bruises away, murmuring, you poor, brave girl. By 24, they hadn't seen each other in what, five years? Not since that day in Folkestone. But they telephoned sometimes, generally in the small hours of the night, when one of them was drunk. Eve had known he was back from Ireland. He'd talked a little of his training school, talked with more excitement of being made military attaché to Riga but instead he'd blown his brains out. The evidence shows that the deceased had brooded over his non-appointment as an attaché at Riga, the newspaper announcement read. Cancelled due to his having undergone a sentence of penal servitude. The army had punished him for the old sin, Eve had thought bitterly. They didn't mind an officer with a soiled reputation if there was a war on, but afterward he was just an embarrassment. I'll go on working until I can't anymore. His voice rang in her ears once again, so loud and clear he might as well have been sitting in the cab with her. Then I suppose I'll die. Bullets, boredom, or brandy. That's how people like us go. Because God knows we aren't made for peace. That we aren't, Eve murmured. It wasn't until the solicitor arrived on her doorstep the following day that she fell apart completely. The solicitor who had mailed her the announcement of Cameron's death in the first place now bringing legal papers and assuring her of his complete discretion, telling her that the pension paid to her account for the last five years had not come from the war office after all, but from Cameron, that he had ensured it to continue after his death, 
tied it up in his will in a private bequest without his family's knowledge, and separate from his widow's funds. That it was well invested, the earnest solicitor intoned, and should continue for Eve's life. She chased the solicitor out, shrieking, and then she collapsed utterly, crawling into her bed like a wounded animal and hiding there for months. How did you do it, Cameron? she'd wondered, staring at her own Luger. Barrel to the temple, under the chin, or between the teeth, the kiss of cold steel and gun oil, the last sensation on earth. Eve had played those games often in the years that followed, on dark nights when the guilt wouldn't let her sleep, putting the Luger through the paces of suicide. But she had never quite pulled the trigger. Too much of a stubborn bitch, she used to think. No fatal streak of romanticism or nobility in her soul, not like Cameron's. But now, as the cab streaked out of grass and past the mimosa fields, Eve wondered if it had been not stubbornness, but fate. Maybe guilt and grief could not be sated until justice had its turn first. Maybe it was the cold, spy-trained part of her brain whispering that despite Cameron's decades-long lie, the enemy was still out there to be dealt with. And until he was, the bullet between the teeth could not be fired. Well, tonight the enemy would die. For Lily, for Rose, for Charlie, for Eve. Tonight Evelyn Gardner's fight would be finished. More than thirty goddamned years past due, but better late than never. She thought of the last bullet, knowing Charlie would hate her for firing it, and so would Finn. But it was partly for them, as they'd realize later. A murderer dead next to her victim left them utterly in the clear. No one would be punished for this but the guilty. They could swan off into the sunset together, bless them. Madame, we have arrived. The cab halted at the end of an access path that led perhaps a quarter mile toward a gracious little jewel of a villa. Its white walls shone in the moonlight, and its roof peaked against the dark sky. Several windows showed light through the curtains. He was home. Eve wondered how long René had sat in that restaurant, nibbling his toast points after she and Charlie left. Not long, she suspected. That told her something. He was still frightened of her. You should be, she thought. Shall I drive you to the doorstep, madame? I'll walk, she said, and swung out of the cab. Chapter 41 Charlie I'm sorry, Finn, I thought every time I heard the Laganda's gears grind. I hadn't driven much in the last year. It was now full dark, and I could hardly reach the pedals. The car was groaning at me as I steered her through the narrow French roads. I swear if there is so much as a scratch on your baby when this is done, I will make it up to you. The brakes gave a resentful squeal, and I winced. I didn't drive particularly well, but I drove fast. I was outside class in no time, and then the fun started. Just past the mimosa fields wasn't exactly a pinpoint instruction in a city surrounded by acres of flowers. A half-moon climbed as I hunted, aware that Eve was ahead of me and time was ticking by. I thought of her facing me in the hotel, telling me to get out of her way. She looked like a worn-out knight lowering his visor for one last charge, haggard, gaunt, composed, serene. My brother had had that expression the last time I saw him alive, I realized. The expression that said, I am ready to die. Not Eve, I thought. Please not, Eve. If I failed her, lost her, I was never going to forgive myself. The Rue des Papillons sported several private paths leading to country villas for the rich. The first I tried led to a house with a prominent for sale sign, the second to a family home, where about six children were trooping inside for supper, clearly not René's domicile. Now I leaned forward and against the dark sky saw the dim peak of another house, Heart hammering, I pulled as much to the side as I could and scrambled out. There was a mailbox and just enough moonlight to read the curling script, Gautier. This was the house. I saw no cab, no sign of Eve. Let me not be too late, I prayed, and began running toward the house. The scent of mimosa hung faint and sweet in the air, smelling as I imagined a baby's hair would smell. My hand went to the tiny bump of my stomach as I ran. 
and I had a moment's stark terror, not for Eve's safety, but for my own, because it wasn't just me who could be hurt tonight. No one will be hurt tonight. I would make sure of that, somehow. I rounded the corner of the house, heading toward the back door. Chapter 42 Eve Most country kitchens would be unlocked, at least in a time of peace. René Bordelon's was not. Eve had anticipated that. She set down her satchel and plucked two hairpins from the knot of her hair. It had been a very long time since her lock-picking lessons in Folkestone, but it wasn't difficult. All you needed was one pin to brace, and the other to gently work at the tumblers. Even so, manipulating the pins with her destroyed fingers took long, agonizing minutes. If it hadn't been a very old, very simple lock, Eve might not have managed it. When the click came, she took another moment on the threshold to steady herself, letting her breathing slow. She had only one chance at this, and she would not shoot straight with a galloping heart and an unsteady hand. At last, Eve trusted herself to step inside, taking her luger out and leaving the satchel on the threshold. A large country kitchen, empty. Nothing but trestle tables and hanging pots lit by moonlight. Eve padded through the shadows, turning the handle of the door at the other end of the kitchen. A tiny creak, and she froze for another agonizing moment, listening. Nothing. She eased out into a corridor lined with oil paintings, candle sconces. A strip of rich carpet made her steps noiseless. Renée's lavish taste helping her on the way to kill him. A faint thread of music drifted on the air. Eve cocked her head, listening a moment, then ghosted down a branching hall to the right. The music grew louder, something lush and involved. Debussy, she thought, and smiled. Chapter 43 Charlie No, I whispered. No. The villa's kitchen door gaped open. Eve's satchel lay on the step. I rifled through it. No luger. I was too late. But I heard no shots, no voices. The house was silent as an unexploded grenade. I wanted to rush in screaming her name, but I was in René Baudelon's territory now and I would not rouse that viper if he was still unaware of what had come for him. If. Perhaps he was beyond defending. Had Eve already killed him? My blood screamed in my veins, telling me to run, to protect myself and the rosebud, not to walk any farther into this nest of danger. But my friend was here, and I kept moving. A dark kitchen, a door ajar, a long hall, rich and quiet, my heart thundered. The faint sound of music. Were those footsteps? The dimness seemed to pulsate. I followed the music, and as I turned a corner, I saw them, framed in the broad door arch like a painting. Eve in a silhouette, a dark shape against the brilliant light flooding from the study. It looked exactly the same as the one in Lille she described to me. Green silk hung walls, a gramophone spinning its music a Tiffany lamp throwing peacock colors. René stood in his immaculate shirt sleeves before an opening traveling case, oblivious, turned away from the door. Eve was raising the luger. Too late for me to dare intervene. I froze, pulse pounding. Neither Eve nor I made a sound, but the lifelong instincts of a snake must have hissed a subliminal warning, because René jerked around. His sudden motion seemed to startle Eve. She squeezed her trigger before the Luger's barrel had fully leveled. The shot ricocheted off the marble mantel, and my ears rang. René was scrabbling in his traveling case. There was no surprise on his face, no fear. Only a poisonous leap of hatred as he raised something toward Eve, as Eve's arm straightened again. It happened as slowly as if trapped in amber. Two Lugers leveling, two triggers pulling, two shots firing. One body falling. Eve's. After that endless moment, everything happened at once. Eve's luger clattered to the floor, and her gaunt body sagged against the carpet. I lunged down the corridor, but not fast enough. 
Rene had already stepped forward and kicked Eve's pistol away into the corner of the study. I'd meant to rush at him before he could shoot again, but he was backing away out of my reach, his own pistol leveled at me. Down on your knees, he said. So fast. It had all happened so fast. Eve made a faint sound at my feet, her crippled hands clamped over her left shoulder, and I knelt beside her. I felt the hot slide of blood as I gripped her fingers. Eve, no, no. Her eyes were open, colorless, blinking slowly. Well, she said in a high, flat voice. God damn it. The record on the gramophone came to a hissing end. I could hear the rasping chorus of our breathing, mine in hitching gasps, eaves in shallow halts. René Baudelon's fast and deep, as he stared at us through a study that reeked of gun smoke. A ribbon of dark blood coursed slowly down his pristine collar. Half his ear dangled from a shred of flesh, and a silent howl tore through me. Close. Eve was so close. The thought flashed through my mind as I stared into the infinite black hole of the Luger aimed right between my eyes. Move that way, girl. The barrel gestured. Away from the old bitch. No. My hands were pressed on top of Eve's, over her wound. I was no nurse, but I knew she needed bandaging, pressure. He will not let her have any of those things. He will see her dead first. But I still said, no. He fired another shot, making me scream as the door jam beside me splintered. Let her go, and slide along the wall that way. Eve's voice was ragged but clear. Do it, Yank. My fingers were clenched so tight over Eve's I had to force them open. Her hands were gloved in blood, and more blood oozed down her torso, slow and implacable. René's pistol followed me as I inched away and set my back against a tall bookshelf but his eyes stayed riveted to Eve as she managed to pull herself half sitting against the door frame. Her eyes were flat stones full of agony, but I didn't think it was the pain of her own wound. It was the pain of seeing him still on his feet. Failed, her gaze screamed, filled with self-loathing. Failed. I was the one who'd failed. I couldn't keep her safe. Bands off that wound, Marguerite. René's voice was rattled out of the toneless calm he'd maintained at the restaurant. I'm going to watch you die, and I don't want anything slowing that down. Might be a while. Eve looked down at her own shoulder. Nothing too vital in a shoulder for a bullet to hit. You'll still b -b -b bleed to death, pet. I like that better. It's slower. Eve peeled her crimson hands away from the dark, spreading stain. My throat closed as I saw it. Just a shoulder wound, and yet it was going to kill her. We were going to sit in this elegant study, the home of all Eve's nightmares, and watch her bleed out. René ignored Eve's wound, his eyes mesmerized by her knobbled, bloody hands. You wore gloves this afternoon, he remarked. I wanted to see how they looked after all this time. Not too pretty. Oh, I think they're lovely. I made a masterpiece there. Close all you want, Eve nodded toward me. But let the girl go. She has nothing to do with this. She wasn't supposed to be here, but she is. René cut her off. And as I have no way of knowing what you've told her, and what kind of trouble she could make, she dies here too. Once you're dead, I'll take care of her. Do think on that as you bleed out, Marguerite. I can see she means something to you. I sat in an ice-water drench of terror, with my arms folded tight around my budding belly. I was not even twenty years old, and I was going to die. And my rosebud would never live at all. You can't afford to shoot her, René. His voice was even, conversational, at what cost I couldn't imagine. I may be a rattled crone with no friends and f family to look for me, but she's got both, and they've got money. Kill her, you'll have more trouble than even you can ooze your way out of. René paused, and my heart nearly stopped in my chest. No, he said at last, 
touching a hand to his mangled ear and wincing. You broke into my home and attempted to rob me, a frail old man living alone. I managed to fire back. Naturally, I had no idea in the dark that you were women, much less the women who accosted me at the restaurant today. I had to sit down without palpitations after firing, and by the time I managed to telephone the police, both of you were sadly dead. Simple country people like those here do not look kindly on intruders. My hopes crashed. I wasn't entirely sure he'd get away with it as easily as that. The restaurant staff could surely testify that he'd known us, but he could muddle things long enough to flee if it proved necessary. He'd clearly already been preparing to run. The traveling case told that story. Eve had been right. René Baudelon always ran from consequences. He'd outrun the consequences of two wars, and with money and luck, two things he'd seemingly never been short on, he could in all probability outrun this too. Over my dead goddamn body, I thought, and nearly burst out in hysterical laughter, because that was exactly how it would happen. Eve would die, and then I would, and then he'd step out over our bodies. He probably would have shot me already if he'd thought about it more clearly. I was young and strong and still a physical threat. But he wasn't thinking clearly. The woman who had humiliated and outwitted him lay dying before his eyes. Until she had gone, she was his whole world, and I was an afterthought. His eyes devoured her. You th think you can shoot a strange girl between the eyes as she stares at you, René? Eve was still arguing, still staring him down but the pulse of blood from her shoulder was coming faster. The only time you ever pulled a trigger it was to shoot a man in the back. I had no doubt at all that he would be able to kill me in cold blood. None. He might have been too fastidious to do his own dirty work when Eve first met him, but he was a different man now. Eve, don't talk. My voice came out tinny. Save your strength. For what? René looked contemptuous. Rescue? I assure you no one heard our shots. The nearest neighbor is at least three miles away. Rescue? My thoughts leaped another way, toward Finn, for whom I'd left a hasty message at the hotel desk, telling him where we'd gone and why, in case things went wrong. Well, things had certainly gone wrong. I had a brief, delirious image of him roaring out of the night to rescue us, but I didn't think fate would be so helpful. I assure you... I have no qualms about shooting your little American here. René fished a handkerchief one-handed from his breast pocket, clapping it to his shredded ear. My study is already ruined. A trifle more blood on the walls makes no difference to me. Rose, I thought in a stab of anguish. Rose, what do I do? I didn't know if I was asking my cousin or my daughter. My eyes hunted everywhere for a weapon but Eve's pistol lay halfway across the room. My gaze traveled up the bookcase behind me, a pair of silver candlesticks on top, too far away. He'd shoot me before I could get to my feet. But closer, on the middle shelf. Leave her alive, René. I am begging you. I barely heard Eve pleading. On the middle shelf above my head was a white shape, my miniature bust staring blank-eyed across the room. I'd never seen that bust before, but I was fairly sure I recognized it. Baudelaire. I confess, I didn't think you'd be this quick to find my home. René paced, moving stiffly, as if his age was settling back into his stocky bones after this jolt of action. Who gave you my address, Marguerite? I can wheedle information out of anyone, René. Didn't I prove that with you? The ripple of rage across his face was instantaneous. How ridiculous he was, eaten up with fury over a decades-old mistake. But his rage was useful. It could be turned against him. I gave the bust over my seated head a last measuring glance. One lunge, one good swipe, and I could get a hand on it. The hidden enemy you choose at our arts grows by taking strength from the blood we lose, René quoted. Turns out the hidden enemy isn't as dangerous as she thought she was. Yes, she is, I said. Your hidden enemy isn't Eve, you old bastard. The hidden enemy is me. His eyes snapped to me, and he looked surprised, 
as though he'd forgotten I was even in the room. Part of me wanted to shriek and cower from his eyes, from the pistol that jerked in my direction. But I set my chin at its most contemptuous, I don't care angle. Never had I cared so much. Shut up, Yank, Eve growled. She was sweating, color gone from her face. How long did she have? I had no idea. Get him closer. Eve had once said René planned brilliantly but improvised badly. I had to goad him into something rash, and I knew I could. I might never have met the man before today, but I knew him through Eve. Knew him right down to the bone. I gave him the most scornful look I could manage. The enemy here is me, I said again. I'm the one who found your restaurant in Limoges. I'm the one who hunted Eve up. I'm the one who dragged her all the way from London. Me. He thought you were so clever starting a new life. And all it took to find you was a college girl making a few telephone calls. His voice was arctic. Shut up. Oh, I wanted to. But that wouldn't save me or the rosebud. It was either take a chance and provoke him now, or wait passively to die right after Eve. I don't take orders from an idiot like you, I said, feeling sweat slide down my spine. This Baudelaire obsession of yours, it isn't just really, really boring. It makes you easy to find. You're not clever, you're predictable. If you hadn't named your restaurant after the same damn poem twice in a row, you'd still be sipping champagne over dinner right now, not packing a bag and running. For the third time in your miserable cliché of a life, I said, shut up. Why, so you can talk? You do love to talk. All those things you told Eve, just because she looked at you with her big doe eyes. You're a big talker, René. I'd never called an old man by his first name in my life, not without a mister or monsieur attached. But I thought we were on first name terms by now. Bullets plus blood plus threats of imminent death equaled a certain intimacy. Don't even think about shooting me, I added as his mouth tightened and the luger twitched. My husband's back in glass right now, and if you kill me, he'll bury you alive. I left him a note. He's on his way already. You might get away with letting Eve die here, but you can't murder me in cold blood. Of course he could. I was just trying to muddy the water, get him flustered. His pistol twitched again, and fear froze me until I realized he was looking at my wedding ring, searching my face, trying to see if I was telling the truth. It's true, Eve said, and bleeding out or not, she could still lie like a rug. Her husband's a Scotsman with a temper, a solicitor with colleagues on both sides of the Atlantic. This is getting out of hand, I pressed. Look at you standing there like you've won the game. You've lost. You can't control all of this. Let me go. Let me bandage Eve. His eyes slid back to her. I've waited thirty years to watch her die, you little American cow. I'm not passing that pleasure up for any price on earth. When she's dead, I'll drink champagne over the corpse and take my time remembering how she wept on my carpet after spilling her secrets. She didn't spill any secrets, you filthy liar. You know nothing, René Baudelin said coolly. That sniveling bitch was a tattling coward. From the corner of my eye, I saw Eve's chin jerk. The oldest, deepest wound, her betrayal of Lily. I felt Violette's telegram burning in my pocket. If only it had arrived a day earlier, perhaps I could have averted all of this. She might be bleeding out, but it wasn't too late for her to know the truth. You lied to her, I said. Eve never gave you anything, not even under the opium. The convicting information about Louise de Bettigny came from another source, a Mademoiselle Tellier. Violette's search of the trial records, the portions unheard by the defendants at the time, must have uncovered that. Who knew who this Mademoiselle Tellier was? If we survived this night, we could find out. You learned from your German friends that they already had what they needed for a conviction against Louise de Bettigny, so you knew there was no point in torturing Eve further. But before you turned her in, you made sure she thought she was the informer. I took a deep breath. Admit it, René. Eve beat you. She won. You lied to make her think she'd lost. His drilling gaze flickered. 
Under my shrieking fear, I was pierced by a flash of silver-bright triumph. Eve was struggling to sit up straighter against the wall. I couldn't tell how much my words had sunk in. Renée's Luger moved back in her direction. No, no, me, you look at me. How does it feel? I taunted. You tried to break her, and it didn't work. Nothing has worked for you since the day she outsmarted you. She ended up a decorated war heroine, and you ended up restarting your life twice because you were too goddamn dumb to pick the right side in two successive wars. He broke. Too angry to shoot me from a safe distance, he came at me, the man who killed Rose, raising the Luger as he advanced. But I was lunging up from the floor, my hand sweeping the shelf above me, and the seconds stretched agonizingly as I fumbled, fumbled, and finally seized hold of the bust of Baudelaire. I brought it around in a wild swing, knocking René's arm away before he could fire. He stumbled back, off balance, toward the desk, and my heart lodged in my throat. Drop the pistol. Drop it. But though he fell back on one elbow beside the lamp, that aged hand on the edge of the desk still stubbornly gripped the Luger. Charlie, Eve said, clear and crisp. I knew what she wanted and I was already surging forward with a howl of hatred, swinging the marble bust in a brutal, descending arc. He raised his other arm, protecting his head. But I wasn't aiming for his head. The bust of Baudelaire came down with a sickening crunch on those long, spider-thin fingers clenched around the Luger. I heard bones shatter under the marble, and he screamed, screamed like Eve had screamed when he crushed her knuckles one by one, screamed like Lily had screamed on the surgeon's table in Zeitburg. Screamed like Rose had screamed when the first German bullets came ripping through her baby's body into her own. I screamed too as I hammered the bus down again, hearing another crunch of bones as I flattened those long, long fingers into red ruin. He let go of the Luger. It fell to the floor, and I lunged for it. But René reached out with his undamaged hand and seized hold of my hair, still howling in agony, trying to wrench me back so I kicked the pistol instead, sending it skittering across the floor to Eve. She lifted her blood-soaked hands and raised René's Luger from the reddened floor, brought it level with an effort that skinned her lips back from her teeth, as I wrenched my hair away from that vengeful grip and dove to the ground, as Eve calmly buried a shot between René Baudelon's eyes. His face disappeared in a red mist. The pistol cracked again as Eve spaced three more shots into his chest. He toppled back, sliding to the floor with his ruined hand flung out in surprise. Surprised to the end that there was pain he couldn't outrun, vengeance he couldn't escape, consequences he couldn't evade, women who couldn't be beaten. The air stank, acrid with gun smoke and the sharper tang of gore. The silence fell like a lead weight. I struggled up from the floor, still clutching the bust of Baudelaire. I couldn't look away from René's crumpled body. He should have looked small and old in death, pitiable. But all I saw was an aged viper with its head cut off, venomous to the end. My stomach lurched and suddenly I wanted to vomit. I turned away, folding one arm around my belly, lurching back toward Eve, who still had the Luger in her ruined hand. She looked tattered and blood-splashed, splendid and terrible. And she gave a slow pitiless smile, like a Valkyrie riding in howling triumph over a horde of dead enemies. One shot left, she said quite clearly, still looking at René's corpse. And before my suddenly horrified eyes, she lifted the Luger to her own temple. Chapter 44 Eve Eve's finger was tightening on the trigger when pain split the world apart. Not the dull pain in her shoulder, slowly pulsing blood, but a hot agony sharp and bright as silver, lancing through her fingers. Charlie St. Clair, keening that berserker cry that had torn out of her throat as she lunged for René, had swung the bust of Baudelaire straight at Eve's hand. The shot went off, deafening Eve's already ringing ears, deflected into the wall as Eve's arm jerked off target. Eve strangled a cry of her own as she cradled hand and empty pistol alike to her chest. You yank bitch, she managed through clenched teeth, tears starting in her eyes. My goddamn hand is broken, again. 
The way you tricked me and ran out of the hotel, you deserve it. Charlie dropped to her knees and with quick strength wrested the Luger from Eve's hooked fingers and tossed it aside. I'm not letting you shoot yourself. I don't have to shoot myself to d die. The Luger would have been the better way, poetic justice. When Eve sighted down the scratched barrel at René's suddenly widening eyes, she'd seen it was her own Luger that he'd taken from her so many years ago, the one Cameron gave her. But Eve didn't need a bullet to die. She could bleed out right here. All she had to do was nothing. Get off me, she snapped at Charlie, who was trying to get a better look at Eve's shoulder. The pain chewed like an animal, slow and steady. Let it go, girl, just let it go. I will not, Charlie roared. She lunged around the room looking for supplies, completely ignoring the corpse on the floor. She came back with an armload of clean linen shirts from René's half-packed traveling case and a decanter of brandy. Let me clean this. It'll be disinfectant enough until we can get a doctor. Eve struck her away with the broken hand. The agony was excruciating. Once again, the sensation of red-hot sand crunching in her knuckles. Eve wanted to curl up and weep, curl up and die. She was weak and shaken and done. She had no more enemies to kill. Hatred was the steel strut that had kept her upright. She felt now like a snail without a shell, soft and helpless. It was time to go. Didn't the girl see that? Of course she didn't. Charlie was moving like Quicksilver, refusing to give up. That moment when she spat in René's face that he was too goddamn dumb to pick the right side in two wars. Eve had wanted to cheer. It was as though Charlie had turned into Lily right before her eyes, little and fierce as a wolverine, dancing on her wits just a hair's breadth ahead of disaster, improvising her way out of death. Lily had been defeated in the end, but not Charlie. You don't have to die. Charlie pressed a wad of linen around Eve's shoulder, staunching the blood. Eve, you don't have to. Have to? Eve wanted to. She was a whiskey-soaked cripple with a stutter and no future. Most of her life had been wrecked because of guilt and grief and one bad man. And Eve knew enough about justice to know that killing René wasn't enough to make life sweet again. She must have muttered some of this, because Charlie was arguing. Didn't you hear what I said to him? You didn't betray Lily. The Germans got their information about her from someone else. The moment you told me how you'd been drugged into giving it up, I wondered... Eve shook her head, feeling tears tremble. No, it was me. It had to be. Charlie's accusation spat at René had passed over her ears in a blur. She had lived with the guilt so long it was part of her soul. A few words had no power to shift it. Opium isn't a truth drug, Eve. It made you hallucinate, but that doesn't mean it made you talk. I asked Violette to look into the trial, the things said when the defendants weren't present, and I was right. It was this Tellier woman, whoever she was, another prisoner. Eve went on shaking her head back and forth. Isn't it worth trying to find out more, looking at those trial records yourself? You're a spy. You have an OBE, and people like Major Allenton owe you favors. Telephone Violette. Get more details. No. Back and forth, back and forth. You goddamn bitch. Don't you even want to get out from under all that guilt? Or will you just lie under it like a donkey in a harness? Charlie thrust her sharp little face right into Eve's and bellowed, You didn't do it! The tears spilled over Eve's cheek. This afternoon she had cried crocodile tears to get away from this girl, but these tears were real. She wept and wept, and for a moment Charlie held her, Eve sobbing into her sharp little shoulder. But then Charlie was pushing and prodding, urging Eve up. We can't stay here. Lean on me. Keep that pad pressed tight. Eve wanted to let it fall, let the blood fall out after it, let the police find two curled corpses in the morning, source and spy, captor and captive, collaborator and betrayer, locked together till the bitter end. But you didn't do it. Blood trickled down Eve's side as Charlie half supported and half dragged her down the corridor, back to the shadowy kitchen, out to the warm French night. Eve was still shaking with sobs, and the pain in her hand was shattering. Stay here while I bring the car up, Charlie said. 
You can't walk that quarter mile. But another set of headlights was showing down on the road, next to the gondola's shadowy shape. Headlights bright enough to cut through even Eve's pain-blurred, tear-blind vision. The police? <laughs> Her tongue broke down completely. She couldn't get out a single word. Clumsily, she wrenched at the linen pads over her wound. She'd bleed out before she went into another prison. But Charlie cried, Finn! And soon a familiar Scottish burr was rattling furious words. A strong arm went around Eve's waist, taking her weight. Eve slid toward unconsciousness, hoping it was death, hoping to be done. But still thinking in some reawakened part of her examining, questioning brain. You didn't do it. Chapter 45 Charlie 24 hours later, we were in Paris. Eve needs a doctor. It was the first thing I'd said to Finn outside René's villa, after the initial frenzy of explanations. But if we take her to a hospital, she'll be caught. Anyone with a gunshot wound will be looked at when they find... I glance back at the house. I think I can patch it up long enough to get out of grass. Finn soaked the makeshift bandages in more brandy and wrapped them tight around Eve, limp and unconscious in the Lagonda's back seat. The bullet doesn't seem to have broken anything. She's lost a lot of blood, but with enough strapping. Caught. It kept echoing through my head. We'll be caught. As Finn worked on Eve, I'd run back into the blood-stinking study and wrapping my shirt tail around my hand and avoiding the blood so no one would see a woman's small footprints. Tipped the peacock tail lamp and the gramophone over, and yanked the drawers open like someone had ransacked for a cash box. Maybe it would look like a robbery gone bad. Maybe. Still using my shirt tail, I fumbled in my pocket and found the photograph of René we had been showing all over class, folded and clipped to show just his face. I unclipped it to show the line of swastika wearing Nazis at his side, and dropped the photograph on the bullet-riddled corpse on the floor. I'd felt a wave of sickness then, but Finn was shouting for me and there was no more time, so I stuffed both Lugers and the little bust of Baudelaire into Eve's satchel, quickly wiped the door handles and anything else we might have touched, and ran. I drove the Laganda back to the hotel, with Eve stretched out in the back seat, and Finn followed in the car he had borrowed from the hotel manager to get here. That first night was the worst. Eve revived long enough to get into the hotel with Finn's coat hiding her bloodied shoulder, right past the yawning night clerk, but she fainted on the upper stairs. Finn put her to bed, washed and dressed the wound with some sheets swiped from the hotel linen closet, and then all we could do was watch through the night as she lay frighteningly still. I stared at her through blurring eyes, and Finn wrapped me in his arms. I could kill her, he whispered, pulling you into danger. I'm the one who followed her, I whispered back. I was trying to stop her. It all went wrong, Finn. She could be arrested. His arms tightened around me. We won't let that happen. No, we would not. God knows I'd tried to keep Eve from killing René, but now that it was done, I had no intention of letting the police get their hands on her. She had suffered enough. I looked at her, frail and unconscious in the bed, and suddenly I was shaking with sobs. Finn, she tried to k kill herself. He kissed the top of my head. We won't let that happen either. We checked out at first light, my arm about Eve's waist keeping her steady. The clerk was yawning, incurious, and we were out of glass in an hour, Finn pushing the Laganda far past her usual pace. Gardner, he muttered as the gears protested. You owe me a new car. I'm never getting those bloodstains out of the seats, and this engine is never going to be the same. All through that long day of driving, Eve never spoke, just huddled in the back seat like a collection of gaunt bones. Even as we drove into Paris, motoring over the dark waters of the Seine, and she watched as I tossed the bust of Baudelaire out the window into the river, she did not say a word. But I saw her shudder convulsively. God only knew how, but Finn found a doctor willing to give Eve's wound a look without asking questions. You can always find men like that, he said after the man disinfected, stitched, and left. Disqualified doctors, old army lads. How do you think ex-convicts get patched up if they don't want a record that they've been getting into brawls? 
Now that Eve had her fingers splinted and her shoulder dressed, had pills for pain and pills to keep infection away, we decided to lay low. She needs time to heal, I said, because she was still alarmingly apathetic when she wasn't being foul-tempered. And Paris is big enough to hide in, if anyone... If anyone comes sniffing after us when René is found, Finn and I both thought. But we didn't mention René to Eve, or each other. We found cheap rooms in the Montmartre, and let Eve sleep and take her pills, and call us names for not getting her whiskey. It was a full five days before Finn saw the announcement in the paper. Former restaurateur dead outside Grasse. I snatched the paper, devouring the details. René Baudelon's housekeeper had come for her weekly cleaning, and discovered the corpse. The deceased was a wealthy man living alone. The room had been ransacked. The passage of days made evidence difficult to collect. I rested my head on the paper, feeling suddenly dizzy. No mention that an old woman and her lawyer had been asking Oliver Grasse after him. Maybe the police knew about that. Maybe they didn't. But no one mentioned inquiries being made. No one was looking to connect a rich American widow and her imposing solicitor with a bed-bound Englishwoman and her disreputable driver in Paris. Five days to find him, Finn said, thoughtful. If he'd had family or friends, it would have been sooner. Someone would have telephoned, got worried about him. But he didn't make friends. He didn't care about anyone. He wasn't close to anyone. And I left the photograph on his chest the one with him and his Nazi acquaintances. I exhaled slowly, reading the short notice again. I thought if the police saw he'd been a collaborator, they might not look too hard for whoever had killed him. Robbery or retribution, they'd just... let it be. Finn kissed the back of my neck. Cunning lassie. I shoved the paper away. There was a photograph of René, courtly, smiling. It made my stomach writhe. I know you didn't meet him, but please believe me. He was monstrous. I was the one who dreamed now about green silk rooms filled with screams. I'm glad I didn't meet him, Finn answered quietly. I've seen enough monstrous things, but I still wish I could have been there. Protected you both. I was glad he hadn't been. He was the one with a prison record. He'd have been in even more dire danger of ending up behind bars if we'd been caught. Even I had been enough in the end to take care of René. But I didn't say so. Finn had his pride, after all. Shall we go tell Eve she's probably safe? I said instead. Might stop her hurling insults at us. Eve listened without comment. Instead of calming her, the news seemed to redouble her restlessness, as she picked at the splints around her broken knuckles and complained about her shoulder bandages. I thought she'd be pestering me with questions about her trial in 1916, the evidence Violette had dug up on my urging, but she never touched the subject. And ten days after she'd been shot, I knocked on the door with a breakfast croissant and found nothing but a note on the pillow. Finn let loose with every curse in the book, but I just stared at the terse words. Gone home. Don't worry. Don't worry. Finn tore a hand through his hair. Where in hell would that dunderheaded battle ox take off to? Violette, you think? Trying to find out more about the trial? He sprinted downstairs to put a telephone call through to Roubaix, but I stood staring at Eve's note with a different suspicion mounting. I ransacked the room, but both Lugers were gone. Finn was back quickly. Violette's seen or heard nothing from Eve. She swears. I don't think she went to Lille or Roubaix, I whispered. I think she's going home to die. Gone where we can't stop her from pulling a trigger. I'd had such foolish faith that if Eve knew she hadn't betrayed Lily, it would fix the old wound she'd carried for so long. She'd learned she wasn't a betrayer, and her enemy lay dead by her own hand. I'd hoped all that would be enough. I'd hoped she would now look at her future, not her tainted past. But maybe Eve had looked in the mirror and still seen nothing to live for. Once hatred and guilt were gone, Nothing but the barrel of a gun. Just like my brother. My breath began to hitch in my throat. We need to go, Finn. We need to go back to London now. She might not be headed for London, loss. If she wants to kill herself, she could have rented another room two streets down. We'd never know where. 
Or she could have gone to Lily's grave, or... Her note said home. She's had no home but London for more than thirty years. If she wants to die there... Please, no. No. That second drive across France was very different from the first. The car seemed empty with no acerbic presence in the back seat. And there were no detours to Rouen or Lille. Just a straight, fast drive in a matter of hours, from Paris to Calais. Then the ferry carrying us back to a bank of English fog. By the following morning, the Lagonda was chugging toward London. My throat closed, and I realized in sudden shock that today was my twentieth birthday. I'd forgotten all about it. Twenty. At nineteen, not even two months ago, I'd gotten off the train in the rainy dark with my photograph of Rose and my impossible hopes. Evelyn Gardner had just been a name on a piece of paper. I hadn't known Eve or Finn or René Baudelon. I hadn't even known myself. Not even two months. How much had changed in such a short time? I rubbed my just-rounding stomach and wondered when the rosebud would start to move. Number 10, Humpson Street, Finn muttered, steering the Lagonda through the pitted streets. London still had its scars of war, but the people strolling along those pocked streets had more swing in their steps and cheer on their faces on this warm summer day than they had when I'd first arrived. Finn and I had the only grim faces to be seen. Gardner, you'd better be home. Home and safe, I prayed. Because if I came through the door of Eve's house and saw her lying there with a pistol in her stiffened hand, I was never going to forgive myself. I won't let go, I told her in class. I can't lose you. If I did. But number 10 Hampson Street was empty. Not just empty. There was a new sign posted. For sale. Six weeks later. Ready? Finn asked. Not really. I turned for his inspection. Do I look grand enough for Park Lane? You look like a bonny wee thing. Not that wee anymore. I was very obviously pregnant now, rounding stomach hugged tight by my black dress. It wouldn't fit me much longer, but I'd squeezed into it today for luck. It made me look very elegant and adult, and I needed that this afternoon, because my mother and father had come to London, and they were waiting for me at the Dorchester on Park Lane. My mother and I had been telephoning a good deal since I'd come back to London. No matter what she'd said to me when we were last together, she was my mother, and I knew she worried about me. Cherie, you must have some kind of plan, she'd ventured a few weeks ago. We'll meet. We'll all talk. I'm sorry, but I don't want to come back to New York. It was a sign of just how nervous my mother was that she didn't argue. Then we'll come to London. Your father has business there very soon anyway. I'll come with him, and we'll all sit down and make some plans. I already had plans. I'd been refining them these past weeks while sharing Finn's little bedsit. We worried about Eve, going almost every day to her house to knock. But it wasn't just Eve we talked about over our one-pan breakfasts. It was the Rosebud, for whom I was slowly acquiring a proper layette. It was the future and how we could manage it, Finn outlining ideas and me scribbling figures on my bank statements to see how those ideas could be made a reality. And the bankers had no trouble allowing me to withdraw my own money once I came in with my false wedding ring on. But I wasn't sure how interested my parents were going to be in my plans, so I prepared for them to tell me what course of action they had decided on, and prepared to say no. Whether I was still underage or not, they were going to find out I was not nearly as easy to push around as I used to be. Facing a pistol-wielding murderer does tend to put parents further down the list of things to be intimidated by. Still, I was afraid this meeting would go awry, once I put my foot down, and I didn't want it to go awry. In spite of everything, I missed my parents. I wanted to tell them I was sorry I'd caused so much trouble, that I understood better now how losing James had wrecked them so utterly. I wanted to say how much I wanted them back. You're sure you want me to come? Finn wore the charcoal gray suit he'd worn in Grasse as Donald McGowan, solicitor. My Donald. Your mother didn't have a very good first impression of me in Roubaix. You're not getting out of it that easy, Finn Kilgore. Let's go. He grinned. I'll hail a cub. The Lagonda was back in the shop, where Finn, when he wasn't repairing other people's cars, 
was at work rebuilding her engine. The final dash from Paris really had been too much for the old girl, more's the pity. It would have given me a great dose of confidence, gliding up to the Dorchester and the Lagonda. She might be scrap metal under the hood, but she was still all style. I picked up my hat, a really stunning black confection I'd splurged on, because I remembered Eve shaking her head over the Queen of Spies' passion for morally questionable hats. This little puff of black gauze and feathers was definitely morally questionable, and I smiled as I tilted it over one eye. Very nice, Yank, I imagined Eve saying, and felt the usual lurch in my stomach. The company that had put her house up for sale couldn't tell us anything. They'd received their instructions by telegram. All we could do was leave a note with Finn's address, begging her to contact us, and go by the house whenever possible to see if we might catch sight of her. All we'd sighted a week ago was a notice on the door that the house had been sold. Where are you? It was something Eve seemed content to let us wonder. On the days I wasn't terrified she was dead, I wanted to kill her myself for making me so afraid. Charlie Loss. Finn's voice from the open door sounded strange. Come look at this. I took my pocketbook and joined him at the doorstep. Anything I was about to say died in my throat as I looked out. Sitting low and rakish at the curb outside was an absolute stunner of a car. It gleamed in the morning sun, a convertible in glittering patrician silver. The 46 Bentley Mark VI, Finn whispered, moving toward it like a sleepwalker. Four and a half liter engine, independent front suspension by helical springs, divided propel shaft. He ran an unbelieving hand down the fender. But it wasn't the car, lovely as she was, that started my heart pounding. Tucked under the windshield wiper was a big white envelope with our names in a familiar black scrawl. My mouth went dry as I ripped the envelope open. There was something bulky at the bottom, but it was the single sheet of paper I yanked out first. The note began with no apology, no salutation, no greeting. Of course it didn't. You started the process with Violette, Yank but I had to find and see the details for myself to believe it. Lily's name and involvement in the Alice Network were given by a former cellmate, Mademoiselle Tellier, who in return for a relaxed sentence passed the Germans five letters and a confession during the time I was being questioned by René Baudelon. Confirmed with difficulty through trial records, classified documents, and other backroom sources. But confirmed. Also confirmed, Tellier poisoned herself after the armistice. René lied. It wasn't me. You were right. I realized I was crying like a helpless thing, but I wasn't helpless at all. For so long I'd listened to the nasty inner voice telling me I was, that I'd failed my brother, my parents, Rose, myself. But I hadn't failed Eve. And maybe I hadn't failed the others as badly as I'd always thought. I'd done what I could for Rose and James. I couldn't save them but it wasn't my fault they died. And I could still fix things with my parents. As for Charlotte Sinclair, I could take care of her. She had taken the hopeless mess around her, pared away the meaningless variables, the Ys and Zs that didn't matter, solved for X. She had things broken down to a very simple equation, herself plus Finn plus the rosebud. And she knew exactly how that equation came out. Eve's note read on. Violette has written me. I'm on my way to France, where the two of us will visit Lily's grave. After that, I'm going traveling. We'll be back in time for the christening. In the meantime, I owe you some pearls and Finn a car. Finn took the envelope, upending it. A tangle slid into his big hand. The keys to the Bentley, all tangled up with a string of perfect milky pearls. My pearls. I'd gone back to the pawn shop as soon as I returned to London, but my ticket had expired and they were gone. Yet here they were. I could hardly see them. The tears were dripping so fast. One last line in the note. Call it a wedding gift. Eve. We brought traffic in and out of the Dorchester to a standstill. Porters, bellboys, elegantly hatted men and their white-gloved wives. Everyone turned to look as the Bentley came to a halt before the hotel's facade. She purred like a kitten and ran like a dream, 
and her pearl-gray upholstery cradled me like a hug. Finn could hardly bear to hand the keys to the valet. Take her round, he said, coming around the fenders toward the passenger side to let me out. The missus and I are staying for lunch. Under the hotel awning, I saw my mother in a frilly blue dress, my father looking up and down the street. Saw my mother's gaze linger rather appreciatively on Finn and his handsome suit. Saw my father run his eyes over the superb lines of the car, and then saw their lips part in surprise as Finn handed me out in my dashing hat and French pearls. Maman, I said, linking my arm through Finn's and smiling. Dad, I would like to introduce you to Mr. Finn Kilgore. We haven't made it official yet, seeing my mother's eyes dart to my left hand. But we're planning on it very soon. We've got a great many plans for the future, and I want you both to be part of them. My mother began to flutter, and my father fluttered too in his more reserved way, as Finn offered a hand, and I made further introductions. Then, as the four of us turned toward the doors of the Dorchester, opening onto its incredibly elegant inner court, I looked over my shoulder and saw her one last time. Rose stood under the hotel awning in a white summer dress, blonde hair ruffling in the breeze. She gave me her impish look, the one I remembered so well, and she waved. I waved back, swallowing the thickness in my throat, smiled, and led the way inside. Epilogue Summer, 1949 The flower fields outside class were in bloom, waves and waves of roses, jasmine, hyacinths. The air was heady, and the cafe made a beautiful place to sit. Those striped awnings invited you not to hurry on your way to Car nor Nice, but to put your feet up, order another bottle of rosé, and while away another hour looking over the hills. The lean woman with the silver-touched plait had been there long enough to stack up several empty bottles over the afternoon. Her face was very brown. She wore boots and khaki trousers, and a stack of boar tusk ivory bracelets on one wrist. And she had the seat in the corner that put her back to the wall, and her eyes on all possible lines of fire. But she wasn't thinking about lines of fire at the moment. She watched the cars come and go on the road below. You'll be waiting a while, the cafe girls had warned when she first came stalking in, asking for the owners. Monsieur and Madame drive up into the flower fields every Sunday to picnic. They'll be ours. I'll wait, Eve said. She was used to waiting. She'd waited more than thirty years to shoot René Bordelon, after all. And ever since then, she had spent a good deal of time waiting under a killing sun for game. Shooting René had taught Eve just how much she liked to stalk, hunt, and kill dangerous things. She didn't care for targeting shy gazelles or graceful giraffes, but the huge wild boars of Poland, or the pride of man-eating lions stalking a village in East Africa, had proved fair targets for the pair of lugers sitting oiled and immaculate in the satchel under her chair. And no one on a hunting party cared if she still swore too much, drank too much, and occasionally woke shuddering from nightmares, because it wasn't uncommon for her fellow hunters to show similar scars. Not on the hands, maybe, but in the eyes eyes that had seen terrible things, and now looked for respite in the world's more remote and dangerous far corners. There had been a tense, graying English colonel on the last safari, who never said a word about Eve's mangled knuckles, as long as she never inquired why he'd left his regiment after El Alamine, who had sat up late over a good many bottles of scotch, and asked if Eve fancied travelling with him this winter to see the pyramids. Perhaps she would. He had long-fingered hands a little like Cameron's. A car rumbled past the cafe garage, a Bugatti with the top down, full of whooping Italian boys on their way to the coast. This place saw good business from the fast-living drivers racing along the Riviera roads, Eve judged from the expanded garage. Finn Silver Bentley was there, the one she'd given him, and next to it a Peugeot with its hood raised, and an Aston Martin up on blocks. She could well imagine people coming to the garage for repairs, and waiting at the adjoining cafe, Nibbling biscuits with rose jam, drinking too much wine, crooning along to the radio. Edith Piaf was playing now, Mon Légionnaire, an old favourite. It was late afternoon by the time the car chuffed up the slope. The Lagonda, rolling along at a dignified pace, her dark blue sides still buffed shiny as a dime. 
it pulled into the garage, and Eve waited, smiling. A moment later, out came Charlie in slim black pants and a white blouse, tanned golden brown, her hair cropped in a sleek bob. She swung a picnic basket in one hand, and with the other kept firm hold on a little girl's dusty smock. Eve wondered how old her goddaughter was, and had no idea. Eighteen months. Eve hadn't seen her since the christening, and this sharp-chinned blonde creature with the furious scowl was very different from the gurgling armful in rose vine-embroidered frills whom Eve had held over the font. She donned her medals for the occasion, worn straight and proud on her shoulder, where they belonged. And tiny Evelyn Rose Kilgore had nearly tugged off the quad de guerre on her baby fist. Finn, Charlie was calling over her shoulder. Stop tinkering, it's Sunday. You're not allowed to tinker on Sunday. His voice floated out. Almost done. That old oil leak. Good thing we don't use the Laganda for anything but picnics. She's practically scrap. Have a little respect, Charlie Lass. Finn came out then, tousled and rangy. Collar unbuttoned to show his brown throat. All the cafe girls were eyeing that twangle of skin at his neck like they wanted to eat it. But he had one arm around his wife and the other reaching down to pick up the baby. Ugh, oh, Evie Rose, he said in his broadest Scots. You're a bro handful, you wee bairn, you. She's horrible, Charlie said as her daughter let out a yell that could cut sheet iron. One cranky baby minus one afternoon nap equals tantrums to the power of ten. Let's put her down to bed early tonight. They hadn't seen Eve yet, tucked at the farthest table under the shade of the awning. She waved one gnarled hand overhead. Her hands still got their share of stares, and they still weren't too good at anything but pulling a trigger. But that was all right. Any fleur du mal who lived to be old was entitled to a little wear and tear. Seeing the figure waving under the awning, Charlie shaded her eyes and then let out a shout, pelting toward Eve. You're going to hug me, aren't you? Eve said to no one in particular. She sighed and rose, and went grinning to be hugged. Goddamn Yanks.